Uh, we'll make a start now uh, with the formal part of the meeting. Welcome to the fourth uh, meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item, uh, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones. Um, they could affect the broadcast system. Of course, some members may be using tablets, etc., uh, for uh, work in the committee's business, um, and that's quite understandable. I have apologies from Sarah Boyack, and that David Stewart will be attending in her place, and I welcome him to join us in the committee for this session and invite him to declare any relevant interests that he has. Uh, thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you, David. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private, and this relates to uh, consideration of agenda item four, evidence heard this morning, and uh, future plans for the inquiry on dairy industry in private. Uh, the committee is also asked to decide whether to consider its EU priorities in private at a future meeting. Are we agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Um, agenda item two, subordinate legislation. And this item considers three negative instruments as listed in the agenda. Uh, Conservation of Salmon Annual Close Time and Catch and Release Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-357. The Designation of Nitrate Vulnerable Zone Scotland Regulations 214 SSI 214-373 and the Sea Fishing Points for Masters of Fishing Boats Scotland Regulation 2014 SSI 2014-379. So the first of these uh, on the Conservation of Salmon Annual Close Times and Catch Release Scotland Amendments drawn up by Parliament um, you know, we brought to the attention of uh, the fact that there had been some mistakes in it and therefore it did not comply with the 28-day rule. However, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have agreed on the grounds that the Scottish Government is seeking to make the corrections to satisfy that committee's prior report. I refer members to the paper. Uh, are we agreed about... Um, that first item on the conservation of salmon. Are there any comments? There are no comments. Okay. Uh, the designation of nitrate vulnerable zones, second SSI. Alec Ferguson. It's a very brief comment, convener, if I may. In th these zones were introduced in 2002, and I noticed that uh, once, we, once we approved this um, statutory instrument, the total area that's currently covered by uh, NVZs will decrease by 24%. I do remember a, a heated debate in this, uh, or the equivalent of this committee in 2002, in which I argued that the zones as um, proposed were far too big. And I just want to put on record how delighted I am that some 12 years later somebody agrees with me. Uh, thank you for that. Are we agreed that uh, there's no other comments on that uh, nitrate vulnerable zones uh, SSI? Agreed. Right, the third item is the Sea Fishing Points for Masters of Fishing Boats, Scotland Regulations. Any comments on that? Um, I have, I'd just like to get uh, some detail from the government, please, about how this register is kept um, and how it's available and indeed um, how it pursues people who perhaps have broken the rules, uh, the EU fishing rules. And I think it's something we need to know about uh, whilst passing uh, the, uh, the actual instrument, it allows for this register an update of it. I think it would be useful to hear from the government just as in a letter, if we can, about some of the detail of what it does, because it is germane to our future planning of the seas and our discussions regarding the National Marine Plan. OK, are we agreed on that? And we agreed that we make no comments on the SSI. Thank you. We move on to agenda item three, uh, and this is uh, an item for the committee to take evidence on the dairy industry from stakeholders in a roundtable session. Uh, and I refer members to the paper, and I'm going to ask witnesses to introduce themselves. Just to remind you, I'm the convener of the committee. I'm the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. My name's Rob Gibson, just in case you can't read my name there. So once we get past the clerks and the official report, if you just say who you are, uh, that would be fine. Yes. Hey, my name is Robert McIntyre, dairy farmer from the island of Butte, and uh, member uh, supplies for Smilk. 
Yeah, I'm David Stewart. I'm the Labour member for the Highlands and Islands. Hey, I'm George Jimison. I'm Milk Policy Manager for NFU Scotland. I'm Claudia Beamish, South Scotland MSP and Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Robert Graham, Graham's Family Dairy. We're a um, dairy business based in Budge Valley. We're also dairy farmers. Dave Thompson, MSP for Skylach Aber and Bednach. Kenneth Campbell, dairy farmer from Castle Douglas. Mike Russell, uh, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Argyll and Butte. Uh, James Withers, I'm Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink, and maybe relevant for this, I'm, in 2013, I chair a review of the dairy sector. Um, Alex Ferguson, MSP for Galloway and West Dumfries, and if I could just say, convener, declare a slight interest in that I last year chaired a review of the Voluntary Code of Practice, which reported in October. I'm Judith Bryans, I'm the Chief Executive of Dairy UK. Uh, Jim Hume, MSP for South Scotland. Graham Jack, Corporate Affairs Director of Muller UK and Ireland Group. Good morning, I'm Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East. Nigel Evans, Vice Chairman of First Milk, um, and also Dairy Farmer and a Board Director, Farmer Director. Uh, good morning, Graham Day, MSP for Angus South. Thank you very much. Um, let me kick off with a, a general question. Um, you can just indicate if you wish to come in on this. Um, this uh, inquiry has been triggered by... Uh, the low prices of milk and uh, indeed the first milk decision uh, about uh, its delayed payments, etc. However, I want to ask you, first of all, uh, because we'll come into the detail quite soon, why does there seem to be a particular problem in Scotland at this time with uh, milk supply prices, etc.? If anyone would like to comment on that, it would be very helpful to us. Just indicate, and I'll bring you in. Yep, George Jimison. Firstly, it's not just Scotland. This is a global situation. New Zealand farmers, are their prices have dropped more than anybody else. It's because they're more exposed to global commodity markets. But since 2007, nobody can speak the sort of globalisation of dairy. Uh, so all farmers in the UK, across Europe, their prices have all dropped to a similar level. The particular problems in Scotland, probably... 40% of the producers in, in Scotland will supply first milk. They're having, they're having their own distinct problems that are caused, again, by the, the global situation, also their own particular markets. Um, the worry in Scotland, possibly going forward, is a lack of process and investment, farmers losing confidence, that sort of thing. But it's definitely not unique to Scotland. It, it's a, definitely a global issue. But there's particular... Probably the, we can differentiate Scotland in some ways and try and identify ways to mitigate against the, the short and medium and long term. Well, I'm looking at a table here from uh, sourced at Dairy UK, which suggests that uh, Scotland's situation is that it's not developing as well as England or Wales or indeed Northern Ireland. So there seems to me to be a specific issue about Scotland that needs to be explored further. There's particular, there's there particular lack of investment, modern investment in Scotland that would, because one thing Scotland can do is, is produce milk. We have the rain and we, we have the, the grass and we have the farmers. In Scotland, I agree with that. It, it's not developing as much as we would like it. There seems to be investment across the country, especially in big liquid processing plants, and there's a lack of investment in processing and marketing in Scotland to, to take Scotland forward. In terms of prices, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be a great deal of difference because Scottish farmers supply the same companies as English and Welsh, and they tend to get the same prices. OK, uh, Robert Graham. As, as a family business, our, our uh, track record for our milk price being uh, a second to none over 20 years. But I absolutely agree with what George is saying about processing investment, and that is it's critical. We have a situation in both in the UK, particularly in Scotland, where our biggest brand for butter is Danish, our biggest brand for yogurt is English, our biggest cheese brand is English. So we need processing investment. I think on, on processing investment, we have plans we'd like to do, and what we would like to see is, is, is government strategy on sustainable economic development being translated um, 
across all of national government and into local government. And I think there's, there's a few challenges around that. But I think there's, there is a lot to go at in terms of <coughs> adding value with the opportunities with, the, with, with this in, in investment. Looking at spreadable butter, um, if, 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 if the spreadable butter is, is, is not Graham's, it's not Scottish. And that equates to 96% of all spreadable butter sold in Scotland at retail is not Scottish. Three quarters of that is Danish. That alone is £60 million pounds of lost opportunity in the economy, in the dairy industry, for our farmers. And that's something we're working on. We've got new products coming out. But it all takes time and energy and, and investment. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Judith Bryant. Yes, um, I'd like to make a comment on this as well and, and just support George in what he's saying. We have very much seen that this is a global issue. It's not just a UK issue or a Scotland issue. This is very much a global issue. We know that volatility is inherent to the milk market and has been for a number of years. If you look at the GDT auction trends for the last 10 years, about every two and a half years we hit a cyclical dip. What we have not been in this country is perhaps as resilient as some people, uh, for example, New Zealand farmers who have had more experience of the volatility <laughs> than we have. So at the moment, there are maybe not the private mechanisms to deal with what we're seeing at the moment. And if we think back to 2014, what happened in 2014 was we had really good weather. Um, people had grass, people had silage, cereal costs went down, but we had a Russian trade ban. So we were already expecting more milk than the global uh, demand needed. But what we couldn't anticipate was there was a Russian trade ban. Now, people will say, well, how does that affect this country? Not too much product goes to Russia. We have had members with containers turned around. But beyond that direct impact, what you also have is that product rebounding onto the EU market, and it's just there in excess. Beyond that, we saw very much slowing down by China in terms of their buying in of dairy products, which was huge for the dairy market. And on top of that, I think there's a, a slight misconception about the fact that in the UK, we have a rather unique liquid milk market, and therefore that shouldn't be affected. Well, of course, a lot of milk in this country also goes into cheese and butter, which is internationally traded. But even when you come to the liquid milk market, when you're producing low-fat milk, you're taking off the butter fat. That goes into the cream market, and the cream is affected by the global butter price. So we have seen a whole confluence of events over 2014 that have created a perfect storm. Um, in terms of Scotland in particular, if you're looking at a lot of cheesemakers, it's very difficult sometimes to have a resilience because if you have a mature cheese then sometimes the costs don't translate over the market dips and, and, and peaks. So as an industry in the UK, Scotland, England, Wales, the whole of the UK, Northern Ireland, we have to develop somewhat more resilience. Well, we'll explore that a bit further. Um, Graeme Jack, first of all. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk from uh, the, the Moolo UK and Ireland perspective. Mm. We're part of a privately owned um, company owned uh, by um, a sole shareholder um, in, in Germany um, who has the opportunity to, to look across Europe and the rest of the world at markets which offer uh, opportunities for him. And uh, his, his view is that uh, the UK is, 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 a, is a market that offers opportunity. And the reason for that is uh, just speaking to a point made by George earlier on, the UK suffers from a historic and chronic lack of investment in um, added value processing capability. And uh, I guess a measure of that, as far as our company is concerned, is that this, the, the UK is currently importing £2.2 .2 billion pounds worth of dairy products every year. So we've given away a share of our domestic market to um, uh, companies uh, in Europe and, uh, and in Ireland. And we see that as being uh, an opportunity. Um, so our view is that we are part of the solution rather than the problem in that we are investing. Um, we've invested around £500 million in the last three years uh, in the UK. Um, 
and 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 we're we, 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 we're alive to opportunities to continue to do that. But that's our assessment of uh, of this market. There's not enough added value processing, and we're giving away too much of our home market to uh, overseas competitors. In addition to that. Um, the deficit uh, between importing and exporting, we're only exporting about a billion pounds worth of products. So we see that as an opportunity too. Okay, thank you for that uh, insight. And uh, Robert McIntyre first, and then James Weather. Um, I'm here uh, really to, to talk about the circumstances of the milk producers in the periphery, that is Butte and Kintyre. Um, we are all members of First Milk, and I can give you an illustration of price, price dive. January 14, I received 32.35 pence a litre for my milk supply to First Milk, and I'm a less than average producer for First Milk, and that's what I achieved. And from that 32.35, we contributed a point, every producer 0.5 of a penny capital contribution. January 15, our price will have dived to 20.98 pence. And from that 20.98 pence, we've got a capital contribution of now 2 pence a litre. So you can see our net price is an appalling 18 point something, which is way, way below the cost of producing a litre of milk. NFU Scotland says it takes 30 pence a litre to produce a, a litre of milk. Um, my college advisor says we might be able to do it for 27, 28, but that would be difficult in the periphery because we've extra haulage costs. Um, as far as processing goes, in Butte, we lost our creamery, first milk shut our creamery in March 2008, it was, 2010, sorry. And at that time, we had 13 milk producers left producing 15 and a half million litres. We've still got 13 producers producing that same amount of milk. We can understand many of them are now totally disillusioned. And where we go from here, uh, we're depending on first milk to, for our survival. And that's a case, it is survival, because we're faced with the summer, we're faced with buying fertiliser to make next year's silage. Where's the money coming from? As an illustration, there are 13 producers in the island of Butte if you project a year forward, there's two million pounds off our bottom line. Two million pounds is essential to, for all tenants to pay rent to Butte Estates, to buy all our inputs, fuel, feed, fertiliser. It's a, a very worrying situation, which some of us are losing sleep over. Thanks very much. Um, the sound is dealt with automatically via the sound man, so you don't need to switch it on and off. Uh, for everyone, no, no, just to let you know. Thank you for that. We'll be coming specifically to first milk questions just in a moment, but that was a good tee up of what the particular Scottish problem is because around 40% of uh, our milk in Scotland does is dealt with by uh, first milk, as far as I understand. Right, James Wither. Thank you, Chairman. Um, probably to echo some of the comments so far, the last 15, 16 years in the Scottish dairy industry has been a story of peaks and troughs. Um, and I suppose it's become more volatile and the gap between the tops and the bottoms of the milk prices have become more extreme. And as Robert figures, I think, just demonstrated, um, what's been particularly noticeable about this current drop is the steepness of that curve and how deep it's gone. Um, so it's definitely a more concerning position than they've been in for a while. Um, it is a global situation. Uh, there's nothing I can see that can be done in Scotland that will change that global dynamic, but we can absolutely be better prepared to deal with it uh, and, and, picking up due this point, be much more resilient. The reality is, in Scotland, we're overexposed at the moment to these global peaks and troughs, and we should be underexposed. Uh, and many other sectors of food and drink industry have got ourselves in a position where they are underexposed because they've invested in strong brands, and the premium end of the market holds up, always holds up well, and even the last few years of tough economic times globally has held up particularly well, and we've seen that in other sectors. Um, there has been a chronic lack of investment generally across the UK and in Scotland in, in added value um, and in processing, um, and that needs to change. And I think maybe if, if one th message the committee can send out is that any dairy company in Scotland looking to invest in added value and extra capacity, we need local planning authorities to fall over themselves to support that um, at the moment. That's um, 
uh, critically important. Um, Scotland is good at producing milk and we have a growing national identity for food and drink. I'm hugely optimistic about the future of the dairy industry, but we have to uh, invest into added value brands. There are real opportunities in the UK, there's no doubt, around import substitution, as, as Robert has outlined, um, but with the real opportunities overseas. 92% of the dairy products we produce in Scotland are sold within the UK. We have a you know, hopelessly small number of customers and we need to get into overseas markets to balance out that, uh, that risk. Uh, that's facing the industry just now. Thank you. Does anyone else want to come in at this stage who hasn't spoken if you wish to? You know, um, Don't worry, everyone doesn't have to answer every question, but uh, don't feel shy about coming forward. OK, that's a general start. Um, we've got to move into thinking about um, you know, uh, the reasons for the first milk decision uh, and what are the implications for the first milk members uh, and other dairy farmers. Uh, in Scotland. So uh, does anyone want to uh, talk further? We've had it teed up by a dairy farmer who's tied to first milk, um, like uh, the rules have it. Does anyone want to come in? Yes, right. Thank you. <coughs> Nigel Evans. <coughs> I think it might be useful to sort of um, just go back a little in terms of what first milk is and what, where it's come from and how, how it operates. I mean, we are 100% owned by our members, our farmers, um, and I'm a farmer myself. And um, we operate um, with uh, an element of farmer equity capital within the business, and we've operated, and we also operate with a, a level of bank debt. And that has, um, that along with the market conditions has been the two reasons for the decisions over the last couple of weeks. And to expand on that further, um, we had a direct um, trade-in issue in the spring and that uh, milk prices started falling away. Um, and I think, um, with the benefit of hindsight, we could have cut prices a month earlier, but significantly not much more than a month earlier because market signals were quite slow coming through to the main market at that point. But the underlying commodity market was actually falling away quite rapidly. And that allowed a, uh, a loss-making situation to, to arise in the early part of the year. Now that, whilst um, it, you know, it was significant, it was not threatening to the business. A bigger issue to the business actually was the fact that the cheese stock values started then to fall rapidly in the autumn. And why that is significant, um, Judith uh, mentioned it earlier on, cheese is a process that you lay down milk, you purchase milk today, you lay the cheese down, it takes time to mature before you market that cheese. And in effect, you're paying a price for cheese today that you don't really know what the market value is going to be six, eight, nine, twelve 12 months out. Additionally, the way that, uh, because the business is funded with a level of bank debt, that bank debt was secured against cheese stock. And as the cheese stock fell away, effectively, the loan facility to the business actually dropped as well. Now, um, in that scenario, uh, we could have borrowed more money or we could have uh, raised money from members. And when we looked at it, um, and particularly, you know, we as farmers, there's five farmer directors that sit on the board, what we assessed was which was the most beneficial to members, which would actually structure the business better, and which would secure a long-term future for members' milk. And actually, we took the decision to raise further capital from members. And in doing so, we reversed a price cut, part of a price cut that we'd announced, which we'd anticipated using that money to uh, take additional lending. Now, Robert is quite right in terms of um, announcing, uh, stating that butte milk and those prices, those are typical prices across the membership at the moment. Um, having made the decisions that we've made, the fact is that uh, the capital retention will be, will be until August, at which point it reverses back, reverts back to the halfpenny a litre that we have traditionally um, contributed as members to the business. Um, and following that point, um, because of a reduction in the debt levels, etc., and more equity in the, of equity capital within the business, the milk price then will actually rise about 0.6 of a penny per litre. Um, now, the big issue for us was the actual deferrable of a milk check. And the reason that that was, de was determined to defer that by 14 days was to allow an immediate injection of cash into the business and uh, remove any need to, for additional borrowings. Um, and thereby actually creating a scenario where, where members supplying the business would ultimately be much better off. So that's a basic sort of outline. Okay, uh, Graham Day's got a supplementary first, and then Mike Russell. Yes, yeah, thank you, Kavina. I'd like to explore this island issue 
and I recognise it's a, this is a huge issue for the whole of Scotland, but let's look at the islands and take the example of Gia, which I very much enjoyed visiting a couple of years ago. Um, we read from written evidence that for the farmers on Gia, they're faced with a situation where, in addition to the cut in the milk price, the capital uh, figure increasing, uh, they now only have their milk collected every second day. They were told to put in bigger tanks, which presumably they had to meet the cost of. They have to pay for the carriage of the milk tankers on the ferries. Um, as a layman, I'm left asking the question, just what benefit do the farmers in Gia and other islands actually derive from being part of First Milk? I think it's the same, it's the same benefit that, that all farmers get. I mean, the, the issues that you specifically raised about milk tanks and collections, etc., we all pay for as members, and we all have those elements attributed to us as members. So there's no differential in that respect. But in terms of what, you know, why would any farmer wish to be a member of First Milk? And I think that comes back to, to some of the fundamentals that are happening in the market at this point. And what I mean by that is we're in an unprecedent, unprecedented market conditions we are seeing a number of farmers at this point, and I'm, I'm told that there's something like 360, 370 farmers that are out of contract or about to go out of contract. And that is milk that's not being picked up by anybody. It's, it's actually being traded on a spot market. And some of it is only picked up Monday to Friday and dumped on a, on a weekend. Now, that's because of an oversupply situation. And what being a member of the co-op of being first milk, if you like, what, what that does for us as farmers, wherever you actually farm, is to give you a guarantee that your milk will get picked up and that you will get paid for it. And in this current situation, those are two critical things for farmers because, if you, if you like, as one farmer described it to me, first milk is the mothership that underpins my business. And it's the same for every one of the sort of 1,300 members that supply first milk. Yeah. So, can I just be clear on this? Are you saying that the farmers in Gia did not, between the four of them, have to bear the cost of putting in the bigger tanks, and it's not just the four of them who are paying for the carriage of the ferry, uh, on the ferry? In terms of the specific on the tank, every farmer supplies his own bulk tank, his own milk fat. Every one of us as the farmers have to do that. And as a, as a business, we have had every other day collection. In fact, it's been in in the industry for a number of years, 20 odd years or more. So it's, it's something that every farmer bears. In terms of the carriage of the, the cost of the milk across uh, from those guys, what happens is in the milk pools and the markets that those guys go into, that forms part of their transport cost. And different milk pools have different elements of transport cost to them. So they will be part of, of uh, actually the Kintyre and uh, gear volume milk pool, and that, that will have a transport cost element applied to it, yes. Right. Okay. Mike Russell? If I could just push this point yep. for a moment, convener, before I want to make a wider point. I mean, to be absolutely honest, it's, it's not just a mothership. There isn't another ship, is there? I mean, in, if you are a producer in Kintyre or Gia or Butte or Aram, there isn't an alternative. That's true. Okay. So you essentially have a captive market for those who are providing for you. You see, I think there are two issues uh, presently, and I, you know, I speak unashamedly as a member for Argyll and Butte at this stage. It seems to be two issues. The first issue is that for my constituents who are dairy farmers, they're actually getting a pretty awful deal from First Milk, which from the outside looks like a very badly run company, which is making its members suffer. There's a wider issue, which I'm very struck by reading the papers for this meeting, which is everybody around this table who's made a submission, a written submission, whatever, actually knows the answer to the problem in Scotland is partially world prices, but actually world prices are used a bit as an excuse in all the papers. The answer is there needs to be a far better focus on a, taking milk products and, 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 and promoting them and selling them and marketing them, uh, both nationally and internationally. The person who put this best, I have to say, I don't want to embarrass him around the table, is Robert Graham, who's at, at the end of a very long period of reading. You were the only submission that I enjoyed because I thought you had the point and you wanted to do it. So there are two questions. I just want to put a couple to first milk before this becomes wider. In that context, your, your stewardship, for example, in Kintyre, of the brand, the Mull of Kintyre brand, has been pretty awful, hasn't it? On Saturday, I went looking for it in Tesco's in Oban. Now, you might wish to blame Tesco's, but I found it one, one type lurking at the bat, back of a shelf for what would be a premier Argyle product in Argyle. So you know, what are you going to do to actually make sure there's a custodian brand like that, that you're actually selling them and helping the farmers who are producing for you? What are you going to do in Campbellton, particularly yeah. with the creamery? 
In terms of Campbelltown, um, there has been a submission um, for some time in terms of what we do to develop the site there. And what part of that, you're right, is about marketing. It has to be about marketing. And there's no pr point in producing a product that doesn't have a market. And part of that comes down to actually developing the market. So there's a market and spend required. Why has it historically not been, um, and your point about not finding it in stores today is a valid one. Why is that happening? And I mean, it's, it's, it's partly to do with what's um, happening in the marketplace in general. What is happening to cheese marketing in the UK? What, and you're starting to see a situation where there's something like 70 odd cheddar brands alone in the UK in the market. And creating elbow room for a brand in that marketplace is, is, is a significant effort and expense required. Um, have we put sufficient effort towards it? Probably not, because the market is changing very rapidly. But I keep coming back to the same point. We are a farmer-owned business. The capital for all of this comes from farmers. And when you have a market situation, as we have at the moment, where price is really under pressure, where does the capital spend come from? Are you saying you are not capable of taking these brands and making them work? No, I'm not, say, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. What I'm actually saying is, does it need more effort? Yes. But That's what I'm are saying. Are you capable of that effort? And will you, yes. are you telling your members that that effort is going to produce results? Because they don't actually see that. They're now the poorest paid of all the suppliers. When are they going to see the benefits of their faith in you and your management team? You ask a question in a way that states that they're not seeing the benefit, but they are actually seeing the benefit. They're seeing a benefit in a number of ways. They're actually seeing the benefit in the investment in the creamery, and bear in mind that the investment in the creamery is a function of the co-op. It comes from all members. Which creamery? In Mullacantaire. Okay, there's going to be investment in Campbellton there Creamery? Is, there, is on, there is investment, there has been investment, and there's continuing investment. When are the new cheese vats to be installed, for which the Scottish Government has offered... Money. There are already elements of that have taken place. We've already invested a million and a half into the whey process, and we're now looking at to go into the boiler section. There's a six million capital spend, planned spend there over the next few years, as well as other efficiencies into the way that, that, that we've looked through the market. I'm sorry to press this convener, but okay, even if I accepted that that was to produce a more efficient uh, use of resource, it hasn't said anything then about how that product is going to be pushed and, and marketed and pushed forward because presently you're, you're, you're selling that as bulk cheese. You're not selling that as Mull of Kintyre cheddar. How do you focus, and I'm sure James will want to come in on Scottish food and drink, how do you actually make something of the, the, the virtue, the product you have? Gia, for example, used to produce Gia cheese. There is no small cheese producer on Gia. That strikes me, given the success of Gia halibut, to be an issue that should be looked at. Aaron, uh, Butte cheese, you know, it, that, that milk now goes to Cowden beef. So how are you going to make the best of those resources? I don't hear the detail of that. It's exactly as James announced, uh, commented on earlier on. If we're going to, to make the best of the resource that is, that is Mullikataya cheese, it has to be exports. Because if you try to make um, a place in the marketplace in the UK, you're not likely to succeed because the UK market is dominated by very large brands and where we can actually get significant traction is in the export market. Mulligan Tire has a great provenance and it has a great provenance in, in, for argument's sake in the US and in the Middle East and those are the markets that we're continuing to develop as, as we speak. I mean, we've just had one of our, mem our members of staff at a trade fair in California and that's where we will actually get traction and additional added value, if you like, for the Mullican Tire cheese. And that, that's where the effort has to go. Is it an easy process? No, it's not. But it is a process that you have to, to, have to pursue. And it takes cost and time and effort. And it will not happen overnight, but it will happen over time. Yeah, but as the time goes on, and I just want to make this final point, as the time goes on, there will be fewer and fewer dairy uh, producers in Kintyre and in Gia and in Butte, because, if I may quote the book of Proverbs, hope deferred maketh the heart grow sick. People can't go on forever expecting it's going to be better you know, this month or next month. There are bills to pay. Robert's just said that. So there is a heavy responsibility on your company, and to be honest, I think you're letting a lot of people down at the moment. I would actually um, disagree with that. I think we've, we are actually supporting an awful lot of people at the moment in what is a very difficult market. Um, as witnessed by the fact that a number of people are out of contract and not getting their milk picked up. 
at least our membership have that as a, as a stopgap. I agree with you. Do prices need to be better? Yes, they do. But again, that's a function of what is happening in the global markets and how that impacts on us all as dairy farmers. Um, it is interesting that um, when you compare prices both within the UK and also across Europe, particularly our nearest neighbours across the Irish Sea and also in Western Europe, where prices sit relative to the UK at present, and they are going through every bit as much pain as we are in the UK currently. And is there higher? Their prices are lower. They're significantly lower. In fact, we had prices come back uh, from Northern Ireland yesterday where their members are already under 20 pence a litre. And a lot of Irish prices, are, a lot of Irish farmers are being told to expect prices under 20 pence a litre come the spring. That is a function of the market. Um, and every company that operates in the market has to face that. And we as a farmer-owned company are no different to that. What will be? to find out about uh, comparative prices, I think, in our further questions on this. Um, I want to move on to the question about the prices charged for milk by some supermarkets. And Dave Thompson wants to ask a question about this. Thank you, convener, uh, and good morning to, to everybody, and thank you for coming along to this committee session. Uh, a couple of points, really, I'd like to get comment from members, uh, people round the round the table. One is the um, the comparison between the, the farm gate price and the cost of production. Uh, you know, if people could comment on that, um, people are getting a lot less than what it's costing them to produce. Uh, and the second point is really to do with retailers' margins. Uh, I have a graph here, and I have some figures which show that the, the retailers' margins have increased from 5% in 1996 to 35% in December 2014. Now, that strikes me, it, that's a massive increase. Um, farmers have been squeezed and processors have been squeezed. Now, again, I would like to maybe get people to comment on why this is happening and what we can do to um, maybe redress that a wee bit and get uh, some of the profit pushed back down the line uh, to producers. So these are the two points I would appreciate some comment on. So who wants to come in on that? Um, Graham Jack first. Um, on the um, question around how we determine the milk price that we pay, um, the price we offer is based on a number of factors, um, including the returns that we achieve for the products that we sell um, and our competitive positioning. So these returns, particularly for cream and butter, they have been badly affected by the um, oversupply uh, of milk and the, the impact of weakening demand. We've seen uh, the value of cream and butter sliding by between 30 and 40 per cent, um, which has a, a significant impact. But because we uh, we have and are continuing to uh, add value to Farmgate Milk through a range of branded and un unbranded products, we're still able to pay um, a leading price regardless of the, the overall market uh, situation. Um, that will not necessarily equate with cost of production uh, because cost of production is, is, is an entirely different uh, uh, metric. We, we, ha we have to work with the market that we have and, and uh, we consider our job to be to, to give, uh, to present a, a competitive price within the context of that market. On retail prices, I've got a very simple response as far as we are concerned. Retail prices are for retailers. Um, they are a matter for, for, for retailers to determine they're, and they're a function of competition between retailers. And we, 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 just, we just wouldn't get involved in the setting of a retail price as a business. I have a brief supplementary at the moment, just before we move on, to ask a question from Graham Day. What is the price that you pay currently? Paying 25.9 pence, so that's almost five pence higher than first milk. OK, thank you. Uh, George Jemis. A comment on both of those. The cost of production model, there's about 15% of farmers will get the cost of production formula. That Sainsbury's, Tesco's, Marks and Spencer's, Waitrose, slightly different formulas, but their price is set on a cost of production, and, and to the retailer's credit, they actually factor in family labour as well. At the moment, these prices are 30, 31, 32 pence. Now, as an organisation, we've always been in a kind of juxtaposition here. Our sister 
uh, Union NFU are very keen on these. We are more, we're slightly more circumspect because it's a minority. We also believe that we have to be market orientated as well. And there's going to be times when the market can't support 32 pence. But what I would say on that before I get the sack is that there's a lack of symmetry in price movements. And this has been proven by university studies independently, that when prices go up at wholesale and retail level, they don't go up as quickly. And when they go down, they go down more quickly. Uh, NFU Scotland put a lot of time and effort into an example of an objective pricing mechanism, which is really based on the returns for commodity dairy products, such as butter, powder, and mild cheese. And the graphs on that are quite symmetrical. They, they follow it, but the UK prices don't. Now, there was a, a bit of a change in 2012 after the Code of Practice was signed in the mass demonstrations where our graphs actually coincided with the, the European graph for the first time in 15 years. We did get a shift from processors and retailers. It took a lot of moving, but we still lack that symmetry in pricing. And that transparency also gives farmers the confidence that what they're being paid is reacting to the market. And farmers are realists. They'll work with that. If they know the price is where it is because it's where it is. Now, these... our Ampi McV prices, as we called it, the market indicators at commodity level, should be the basis, the floor in the market. And as James Withers and I think everybody's agreed, that adding value, export and import substitution should raise us above that. And we have the wherewithal to do that if we have more transparency and more collaborative supply chain. And, and that is what we are pressing for. On the liquid market, there's a real lack of transparency. And I've got a great deal of sympathy for, for processors. Uh, but we don't know. Dairy Co., the, the, the organisation that does this sort of data collection, has given up on liquid milk margins. But we do know in cheese that 50% of the end price goes to the retailer. A very small proportion goes to the processor, who's taken more risk, I would suggest, than, than the retailer. And the farmer, because of his lack of power and pricing, is at the bottom of the heap, so to speak. So transparency is really important. I don't want to get into retail kicking because there's some good retailers out there and there's some bad retailers and the, 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 the code of practice adjudicator needs to have more powers to look into these things. But just one last comment on cheese and butter, as Graham's uh, already referred to. The wholesale price of cheese and butter has dropped 35 to 40% year on year. Now, the retail price index on butter has gone up 4.6% year-on-year, and the retail price index on cheese has gone up 1.2% year-on-year. On milk, it's gone down 2% because we've got the, the supermarket price wars. But on cheese, they're already taken a massive margin, and it's not shifted. So that goes back to price symmetry. Now, with cheese to a certain extent and butter to a lesser extent, there is a lag. I accept that. But for wholesale prices to drop 35%, 40% year on year, and for retail prices not to have moved. Now, we're not wanting to devalue cheese, don't get me wrong, or butter. Because we, we, if we keep dropping the price, people get a perception that these are not quality products. But in a current situation where we're have difficulty shifting dairy products and we've got too much milk, lowering the price of cheese for the family might shift more cheese. So I think there's a question to be answered there, but you know, I don't want it to be an excuse that it's all the retailers' fault, because it's much more complex than that. Well, you have our support for uh, making sure that this uh, clear message about transparency uh, is, is central, and we'll be pursuing that. But uh, are there particular supermarkets that you're concerned about at this time? You, said, you mentioned that it's not all supermarkets. As I say, we don't. We meet with retailers, but we'll meet with their PR people. Occasionally, we'll meet with buyers and all the rest of it. And I'm sure the processors will have a, a story to tell. I know the grocer magazine has done some really good investigative work, but I wouldn't point the finger at anybody in particular because there's good practice and bad practice. Tesco, Sainsbury's, and Marks and Spencer's on liquid milk, they're paying 32 pence or so, which is way ahead of the market. But on other branded milk. The farmer hasn't got that guarantee. They could be buying Robert's milk and, and Robert's farmers will be getting paid 26, 27 pence because that's what your business can afford to pay at the moment. So they're doing the right thing in liquid milk, but on 
branded liquid milk and on cheese, butter, yogurts, they'll be driving as hard a bargain as anybody else. So there's a bit of smokes and mirrors there. There's good practice and there's bad practice. And we hear from Aldi and Lidl that they're difficult companies to work with, but they're straightforward. I get the impression that there's no upfront. A lot of this could be perceived as anecdotal, and it probably is, but you hear stories of if you're bidding for a big supermarket contract, you have to pay to bid. You have to buy shelf space. Now, small cheese companies cannot do that. They cannot compete, and this goes to Orkney and Kintyre and all these sort of things. So I wouldn't point the finger at anybody in particular. Sounds as though um, the little dark back shelf in the supermarket in Oban wasn't paid for very much, and they might have got more if they'd uh, been able to buy something more prominent. Well, who knows? Um, uh, in order to get some more answers for Dave, we've got um, Robert Graham first, then Jim Hume, then Robert McIntyre. Um, thank you. As a, as a business, we've purchased about 12, 13% of all the milk produced in Scotland, it's about 10% of all the farmers. And um, it's interesting, George, talking about cost of production, it does only apply to, to liquid milk and, and um, it doesn't apply to cheese, it doesn't apply to um, yoghurt, it doesn't apply to butter, and also some of the same retailers who have cost of production models will still be 75% of the butter sold in their stores in the UK will come from Denmark. I think um, we're a private business, so right, as George said, we, we pay 26 and a half pence to our farmers. It's the highest price paid by any of the dairy companies in Scotland to farmers. And looking at, I think particularly the private businesses in Scotland, we have, as a, as a farm business, we've been uh, in this since deregulation. We've got a, a record second to none. But certainly, when ref particularly reference to us, but also the private businesses, the prices we pay to our farmers versus farmer-owned businesses, and there's, 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 there are two main operators in Scotland, there's significant differences right now uh, between both the private businesses and the farmer-owned businesses. And private businesses like, like ours, as a family business, we don't go to our farmers and say, can we have also, on top of this lower price, but we're we don't go to them and say, can we also get some capital money in the investment? We invest our own money and take risk mm -hmm. upon ourselves. And, and we, our, mar our margin last year was less than 2% on our, on our profit. Two pence in a pound is our profit. We're making profit, which is good. But this year we'll invest three times what we make back into capital investment, new product development, new product capability, investment in brand. And, and it is having the right management and working hard, as our farmers do, to try and deliver upon the, all the opportunities. Processing, investment, building brands, very kind of uh, much also to say about our, our business, but building brands. But as a family business, it takes time. It takes, it, it, it takes, it takes a long time to build a brand. It's a lot of fire, it's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and, and that's what we do, and, and we invest our money, and, and we, we try and look after farmers as best we can in, in, in tough uh, retail margins. And I can't talk specifically about, about retail prices, but I would think on, on milk, milk just now, I would think retailers will be not have much margin in, 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 the, in the game just now because the ferocity of that retail competition across all the retailers, a seismic shift in what's happened in this retail world, both in terms of new entrants and consumers changing um, shopping habits from large stores to big stores is... It's, it's seismic for retailers, and, and we're, we're seeing that, unfortunately, in the retail aggression. Okay. Um, Jim Hume wanted to perhaps yeah, yes, uh, comment or question. Yeah, no, th thanks, Convener. But just following on what George Jameson was saying, just regarding uh, Dairy, Com uh, Dairy Co and their, and their league table, they still produce a league table, albeit they don't put in what the margins are. There's quite a large uh, variation, and uh, again, this will be across the UK, and it mentions, of course, uh, other parts of the UK uh, processors. The da Dairy Crest are paying producers about 36.54 uh, pence per litre. That was off November 2014. Whereas uh, uh, Dale Farm Northern Ireland's at 22.93. So that's a 59% difference across across the UK, if, if you like. I just wondered if there's any... Uh, thoughts on why there is such a, d a disparity in in uh, 
in what farmers are getting across the, the, the UK. All right, and uh, we can wrap that into. We can come back in a minute, but we'll have Robert McIntyre first, please. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my view is that the power of the supermarkets, and everybody right in this room probably agrees, is extremely powerful. And really, they control what happens. And we've heard from George about his view on supermarkets. Um, we've heard from Robert Graham his view. And we heard from a gentleman, I can't remember who it was, who said the margin that they used to have was 5% and it had gone up to 30 odd percent. And as long, they'll, they'll have these margins as long as we produce the milk. We are now in a situation where it doesn't pay us to produce milk. And if Robert Graham's producers are receiving, was it 26 pence, it won't pay them either because then if you pay per says, for clarity and context, the current cost of producing a litre of milk is in the region of 30 pence a litre. So how long do we go on producing milk till we're burst, till the banker says, or till we can't write cheques at the end of the month? And that time for many of us is with us. So um, we were encouraged, and George says, he was one of the commentators from the NFU who encouraged us to produce more milk in the last 18 months. We've produced more milk. It's causing a huge problem. But we didn't get any advice on where that milk was going. So we're in a situation that's critical. And I'll just say that if farmers go out of business wholesale, where is the milk coming from? We have a huge surplus just now, but then in a short space of time, there might not be, there'll be a downturn. And the people in the more uh, better parts of the UK that can produce milk, the Vice Chairman of First Milk said his cows will be out grazing grass in February. My cows won't be out if there's bad weather, won't be out till the beginning of May. So I've got extra costs, as have Scottish farmers. So I'll just finish by saying it's an ill-divided world. I wonder if Kenneth Campbell has um, a view about that from uh, your neck of the woods. The one comment I would make coming back to, I think George Jameson mentioned, in cost of production, there's no question that cost of production is, is there or thereabouts 30 pence for, for most people. And uh, Certainly my personal cost of production is, is a good deal higher than the milk price I'm getting, but cost of production... Models for pricing milk, I'm, I'm dead against. I think as an industry of producers, we need to be fit to operate in a global market. And if we're not fit to op operate in a global market, we'll need to rationalise until we are fit to operate in a global market. Uh, and if we can't do that, there's really no goodness in what we're doing at all. Uh, and I think it's been said more than once, the clarity of a milk pricing is the most important thing. From my point of view, cost production mechanisms are uh, are cloudy and are very difficult to, uh, to measure and to understand. I think we're, we are getting a, a more a far fairer milk price now than we perhaps did have before the voluntary code and and perhaps before Arla got so involved in the in the United Kingdom, but. Uh, in essence, I, I, I don't like cost of production. I think we need to kind of live by the market a wee bit. We need to, there's, there's things that possibly could be done in the short term, but I don't think we, we would want knee-jerk things to artificially uh, increase the milk price uh, in the short term. Okay, uh, Mike Russell. Yeah, I, I just want to press Kenneth kind of a little on this. I mean, if the global market dictates that there should be no milk production in Butte or Gia or Kintyre. Is that acceptable? I think that's a Scottish government issue. Uh, I don't think, uh, getting back to what was asked earlier by uh, the other end of the table, there would be a limit to how much the rest of Scottish milk pro uh, producers can subsidise the people in Gia and Kintyre and Butte. And, uh, well, with respect to them all, and I wish I wish them every success. I, I think they're in a terrible position just now. But if their cost of production is going to forever and a day going to be three pence higher than than, than everyone else, uh, 
it's going to be up to them whether they produce milk and, and up to the Scottish government to a degree whether they produce milk. Do you not think we've got this rather wrong? I mean, if you look at it, essentially the, the end point of your argument is that those who can produce milk cheapest, right, wherever they are in the world, those who can produce milk cheapest wherever they are in the world will be the ones who will produce milk. Those who have a higher costs of one sort or another, no matter the quality of the product, no matter what can be done with the product or isn't being done with the product but could be done with the product, those are the people who will go out of business. Now, I think if that is the model that we're going to apply to agriculture <coughs> and to you know, rural life, then, frankly, you know, it is not just, as Robert McIntyre said, an ill-divided world. It's not a divided world that many people will wish to live in. I mean, I do think economic determinism as the absolutely only way in which we can decide how we organise our agricultural and rural industries seems to be um, a little unfortunate. Robert's paper, if you've read it, for this committee, actually projects a much a very different view, whereby you can have imaginative, fleet of foot uh, businesses that want to compete globally and are able to do so with different cost bases because they're actually better at doing it and they're selling a, a valuable product. Would that not be an equally valid alternative? Uh, Tyler, I couldn't agree more. Good. Uh, but it, it, it takes time and a great deal of money. Uh, well, it takes a lot of imagination and persistence. And it perhaps also takes, and the one area I might agree with you on in this, the Scottish Government, it takes government and local authorities to be flexible to support this is taking place. For example, in the Butte case, to have a system whereby empty tankers do not pay full ferry fares when returning to the island. That is something which perhaps we could, with a very small adjustment to our overall policy, make a big difference. Um, we, can, uh, <coughs> we, we have quite a lot of questions to, to bring in many people on, but on these two points, well, Alec Ferguson first and then George Jameson. Uh, on this particular... No, I think I'm sorry, I can save you a little time, Convener. We've moved on from what I was going to ask. OK, thank Carry you. On. And George Jameson on this point, regard to I'll try and cover Jim's query on, on the diversity of pricing and also chip in uh, Mike and Kenny's spot. In fin <laughs> <laughs> There's an absolute place for, 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 for all of these things, for absolute certainty. The highest milk price in Europe for years has been in Finland and Italy. Because the, and these are the highest cost of production in Europe. We get the highest price for the milk because they've developed brands, they've developed PGI and PDO, and they've worked hard at it. I remember speaking in Italy to uh, a chap in Parma who sells a, a bespoke cheese, and he, he himself went to meet 100 customers from corner shops to Asda in the UK. And I said, how did he sell it to Asda? I just told him what I wanted because he can't get it anywhere else. Now, we've, we've failed miserably to compete at that level. It's partly to do with our... We do have a liquid milk market that's the envy of the world, but we've even abused that. We don't get the benefits of that. The supply chain doesn't get benefits of that. The retailers use it as a, as a wee badge of honour. But we're not getting the benefits of that. And, and getting back to the diversity of prices... One of the reasons that the retailers are prepared to pay a cost production model is all, these guys need a flat profile, which is a much more expensive way to produce milk than spring calving. So these guys have to produce the same level of milk all the time, which means they have to feed in the summer and the winter at the same levels. Kenny's costs will be higher than, than a lot of people on, on grass-based systems, but the, the retailers want that. In 2007, we had a massive spike in dairy products, and the retailers knew that the British housewife needed fresh milk. So they introduced cost of production models, and they ring-fenced a lot of the more efficient flat-line flat, flat producers to produce liquid milk. So just to finish up on, on, on Mike's point, I absolutely agree that we cannot afford to be without peripheral milk fields because they're so important to the local economy. Mm. They're good farmers in Butte and, and Kintyre and Nottingham, and I've been there several times trying to help things. There needs to be more collaboration between the farmers and between the factory and the farmers and in the marketing. And we need to put a lot of effort into that, and the Scottish Government can help, as they can help Robert Graham. But it, it needs real investment you know, we've got Paul Grant and James Withers working at it, but it needs, it needs more, and I would argue it needs, it needs much funding. If, if Robert's prepared to put £300,000 into a TV advert, can we get some money to entice him to double that effect sort of thing? So I think we can do both. You know, where Kenny's farming, he's getting an Arla price. 
and Ireland is a European price. So getting on to Jim's comment, the, the, the big difference really is the, the retailer lined are at 32 pence. Now consistently since 2007 they've had the highest milk price. But there was a period in 2013-14 when the market price overtook the, the cost of production model and that was because the market was working. The code of practice and, and processors putting in different pricing systems the market was working. In 2013-14, just to have a wee answer to Robert's comment about us asking you to produce more milk, we never asked anybody to produce more milk. What James's review, and we're fully behind it, was that we can grow our industry by improving our marketing, investment in processing, and production reacts to that. The reason in 2014 that we had too much milk across the world was Everybody was getting good prices because the market was strong and every region in the world had good weather. And if you turn cows out, even if you're the worst farmer in Scotland, they'll produce more milk with good weather than they will with bad weather. So it's the alignment. We need to market, process and milk. That has to be in line. The variation in prices, cost of production is at the top, but since 2012 there's, there has been a change of attitude. There has been processors put in formulate pricing that reacts to the market. Dairy Crest have a formula that's based on cost of production and the markets. Now that is still sitting at somewhere like 28 pence. Now Dairy Crest Direct, who represent the farmers, have acknowledged that that's slightly higher than the market can stand and they're prepared to take a penny off that in the interests of the company. That's collaboration. Muller Wiseman offer a, a pricing formula based on something similar to NFE Scotland, Nampy McVie. And for a good part of those two years, that has been paying more than the standard litre. Now it'll be below the standard litre. So we've got different areas. Arla is a European price. It's a cooperative price. It's agreed by the farmers. The mechanism that Arla pay their price is agreed by all the farmers in Europe. And it's set very basically on every month how much money does Arla bring in, how much does it spend and the rest goes to the farmer minus capital retention. So that now is round about 24, 25 pence but that is what Arla are making. Now back 12 months ago Arla's price was 34, 35 because that's what Arla could afford to pay. So the co-ops are paying as much as they can pay First Milk can't pay as much because the business isn't returning as much at the moment because of their particular circumstances. PLCs, and this is where, there's a, where I see something positive, the private companies now, as I put it, are paying as much as they can. They're taking their profit and they're paying as much as they can. Because Robert's price at the moment is higher than Muller's, and Dairy Crest formula is higher. So I see some, that that's a good thing, because in the past, all the liquid process paid the same. If one dropped, they all dropped. If one lifted, they all lifted. But now we've got diversity, which tells me, in my optimistic moods, that the processors are starting to pay as much as they can. We've got a lot of questions to, to deal with, but that was a very good explanation. Uh, thanks very much for, for, for the detail. Um, we, we need to round up this. This is like our second question kind of thing. Out of, um, about ten. Um, James Weathers... Judith Bryans and Alec Ferguson wanted to come in at the end of this one before we try to move on. James. OK, a, a couple of uh, very quick points. And I feel compelled to, um, I suppose, support where Kenny was heading, I think, which is I also have a problem with cost of production models. And I don't know many industries in the world where a buyer of a product would guarantee that they're going to cover their supplier's cost of production irrespective. Um, Farmers need to be able to compete in the marketplace. The absolute key is picking the right battles and picking the right markets. So let's not take on cheap value cheddar coming from Ireland or cheap commodities. We need to forget Scotland as a producer of dairy commodities. We should no longer consider ourselves as a commodity producer of dairy products. It's about picking the right markets. So the advantage we have in Scotland, that, well, the challenge we have in Scotland is we have peripheral milk fields and peripheral plants. The huge advantage they bring is their strength of provenance. Almost the more peripheral you get, the better the brands can be and the better that whole provenance story can be. Gia, Malakintyre, we've not talked about Orkney, you know, a great island brand with a creamery up there needing to forge a future for itself as well. Um, so it's about picking the right markets to compete in and then farmers are going to have to, to structure sales properly. And there is an issue about farm efficiency and um, technical operations. The gap between the top performers and the bottom performers is too wide in Scotland and, and that 
It's a personal view. I don't, others in the room can decide whether that's right or not. To join uh, George's wave of optimism for a second on the market development, as we speak, there are individuals on the ground in Tokyo, in Toronto, in the Middle East, working on behalf of industry and SDI jointly looking at dairy opportunities, speaking to importers, distributors, brokers, retailers, the food service and catering sector. So I think we've got more support in Scotland than we've ever had around international and export development to drive into these new markets. And having that in a balance with doing that added value in local markets is where the answer lies. And I suppose just one very quick comment on Dave Thompson's point about supermarket pricing. Um, I suppose my plea to the committee would not be to spend too much time trying to work out supermarket pricing and margins because it's a road to nowhere and most committees I've seen try to do it give up. <laughs> and I think Dairy Co have, have, have given up. It is what it is. And as, as Robert says, there is a fundamental shake-up happening in the UK retail sector just now, like we haven't seen, I think, probably for a generation. That means that the, um, the cost-cutting and the price-cutting will be to drive footfall in those stores is going to be um, remarkable. So I don't think we'll change that dynamic, but we can be better at building brands, attacking the right part of that retail market and going international. Well, we hear what you're saying, but uh, obviously we have a wider interest in making sure that Scotland has an opportunity to sell our premium product. And uh, we may well have to ask the supermarkets about some of that because clearly uh, these uh, margins that they're taking, you know, are not helpful to the producer, like in many cases. And, you know, I have a long history in this. Sarah Boyack and I and Richard Lockhead at the early stages of the Competition Commission inquiries about this. So we've reached a point where we haven't got any leverage yet over the supermarkets because the uh, uh, Ka Caroline Tacon has not got these powers with regard to this for indirect uh, producers. And, you know, this is crazy after 10 years that we haven't got some sort of handle on this. And we still have voluntary codes and things like that, which we know in many cases don't work. So that's my little rant over for this particular moment. I just very quickly respond yeah. to the to the rant because I understand the um, I understand the point I suppose I think a greater impact can be made um, focusing on areas like brand development market development uh, and also investment in, in processing I think a lot of years have been spent trying to tackle the supermarket question and I think it's done a bit of a disservice to the industry because it's distracted from the real issues around farm efficiency, brand development and export development. Is my well, I don't know that we have avoided the question of investment and uh, we'll probably come back to that in a wee while. We've got to move on because uh, Judith, uh, uh, first of all, and then Alec and Robert, uh, finally, <coughs> question two. I will be, I'll be very quick. On cost of production, again, we would reiterate some of the things other people have said. It's not market-oriented. There's a great diversity in cost of production. The variables change. It's very difficult for a processor to accommodate that and still be competitive, uh, both in the national and the global market. But I was delighted to hear James mention food service because the one point that I wanted to make is we've, we've talked about retail. Yes, we would recognise that um, retailers are the route to market for most dairy products, but actually food service and, and uh, public procurement are another big route uh, for dairy products to, to reach people, uh, people's stomachs, shall we put it like that. And one of the things that we would say at the moment, one thing that could be quite helpful uh, for the dairy industry in general is if there was more procurement into hospitals, schools, uh, prisons, whatever it may be, of Scottish, British product that would be quite a helpful and a useful thing, thing to do. So I think my point is just that the dairy industry is not just producer, processor, retailer. It's far more complex than that. Okay. Um, we have to think about diet as well, which is another interesting uh, sidelight in the year of food and drink. Um, uh, Alex Ferguson. Um, I just wanted to raise a point, Kavina, that the NFUS had put in their written submission in terms of a, a floor price for milk, because the, an issue that you suggested to us was that um, both Scottish governments and UK governments should make representations within Europe to raise the intervention price for milk, which is currently very low, 12 pence a litre, I think, or something like that. Um, it, can I, can, could you just explain in, in one short sentence, if increasing it to... 17 pence a litre or 14, 15 pence a litre, whatever, what practical difference would that make to this current situation? 
Maybe I'll three sentences. <laughs> 2007 was a bit of a sea change with the McSharry and Fischler reforms that moved all agriculture away from market support as far as possible. So in 2007, um, they reduced the reference price for intervention for skim milk powder and butter. Now, the sort of ballpark figure for skim milk powder in 2007 and 10 years before was around about 2,000 euros. In 2007, they dropped that to 1,740 euros. The view and in recompense, farmers were given two to three pence dairy premium, which then became part of the single farm payment. It was acknowledgement that Europe couldn't afford all this market support, but also that they wanted to drop the price so that Europe could compete in the growing world markets. That was the plan. But in 2007, there was a perfect storm in a good way for the industry because prices rose hugely to $5,000. Now, since then, the average price of commodities has been from 5000 and there was an expectation it wouldn't go below 3000 This year, it, it's obviously gone below that. The point with well, that 1,740 euros, so it's equivalent to about 1,400 pounds a tonne, the UK price is round about 1,400 pounds a tonne just now for skim milk powder, is that it's taken... For me, it's out of context. Cost of production has rose, risen considerably since 2007, as have the value of commodities. So it doesn't have the same context. It, 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 it's too low in the context of the cost of production and the actual price of commodities. Now, bear in mind that it was meant to be a floor in the market. It was meant to come into play and they could, you could effectively take 250,000 tonnes of skim milk powder off the market, 109,000, 110,000 tonnes at that price, and then tendered. In 2009, there, in 2009 10 there was 250,000 tonnes of skim milk powder. That's about 2.5 million litres milk equivalent. Now, that worked. That stopped the decline in 2009. Not only that, but the Commission actually made money out of every kilo of skim milk powder because they very carefully leaked it out onto the market, all at an increasing price level. Now, what we're calling for, and we have done for months, and everybody's joining us now, is that there's a review of that. Why is it still at 1740, and where should it be now? Because we're the last to ask for too much market intervention. We were quite in favour of most of the soft landing agreements in Brussels, but that's too low now, in my opinion. But I'd like the boffins in the Commission to have a look at it again. And at what level should it be at? My argument would probably be round about €2,000, because that would take us back a few months and we could have intervention now. We could have powder in store, and it would take the pressure off, for example, first milk's powder price. So it needs analysis. There's a bit... There's a bit of doubt in the Scottish Government about the helpless with it, that how, how quickly that can be changed. That's to go certain processes. That, I read a, an article yesterday. The Commission seem to think they're in control of it, or the Parliament think they've got a say in it. But I would like some clarity on that. I'll try and find out myself. But there's a bit of a debate on who can change that reference price. But I believe there should be some effort in looking at it. <coughs> you know, Mr Hogan believes... It, we, shouldn't, we should leave it alone, but Mr Hogan's from Ireland and he might want to put everybody else out of business and keep the Irish in business with the low costs. But we need to look at it because it's not just Scotland and the UK, but there's a lot of farmers in Europe who cannot afford, you know, £1,400. That is probably 12, 13 pence a litre. That, that Speaking to the Cabinet Secretary about those matters, you know, and related to the next Agriculture Council next week, and uh, we believe that he's already asking for the UK... Uh, to uh, raise this matter. So it's in, in hand. Um, we've got the two farmers we've got here. Well, I know there's more than two, but uh, Robert and uh, Kenneth to finish up at this point. At least we've dealt with question 10 now. You're, uh, you're allowed, <laughs> Chairman, you're allowed to take issue with other members' points of view. Yes, yes well, I can take issue with George Jimison then. Um, he talked about... Uh, Tesco, Sainsbury's who sign up farmers because they're the most efficient. I would say that's not because they're the most efficient, it's because of where they're geographically placed. Yeah, I agree with that. That's, that's a point. Also, back to the lady said, we need to do this, we need to do that, but that's in the future. That takes time, and we don't have the time. Our backs are right to the wall. There are a general view in our island, and I suppose in Kintyre, the actions that 
financial evidence that First Milk, who were all members of, had to take um, with delaying payments. Uh, they stabilised the business of First Milk, but in doing so, they've jeopardised a lot of their members' businesses. Um, and where we go from now, as I've, as I've said already this morning, is a huge worry. Um, am I right in saying, Nigel, that last March we lost a Wiseman contract, which was uh, 200 million litres a year? Mm -hmm. And now we lost that, so we really don't have this lucrative market for milk and liquid sales. That milk, obviously, that 200 million litres was diverted to powder and cheese, which has attracted a much lower price. And now the powder, the, the loss of the Russian market, the Russians, I believe, took £350 million worth of dairy products from this country. So all these factors have combined to put us really in a, a, a position which we're, we're going up at five o'clock every morning. And I don't think anybody else in the UK does this. We're going up at five o'clock in the morning to work for nothing. Mike Russell reads his papers at five o'clock in the morning. You're not the only one that gets up at five o'clock in the morning. He's no, not but, working yeah, for nothing. Take your point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I am paid to do so. Uh, and I think that uh, the point is that these are the things which we can raise with the Cabinet Secretary in particular about what the Scottish Government can do to help at this time. And we will raise those matters that you've uh, uh, brought in just now. Um, Kenneth Campbell uh, on this point. Just very quickly, I would like to concur entirely with George Jimison about rising <laughs> the intervention prices for commodities in, in the short term. I talked earlier about rationalisation of the dairy industry, but we're not going to see rationalisation this spring. It's going to be far worse than that. It's going to take out a lot of farming businesses that hitherto thought they had a good a future in the dairy industry and deserve a good future in the dairy industry and have been perhaps caught out of contract or, or for various other reasons are going to get taken out of business. We're not going to lose the wheat here, we're going to lose a, a cross-section of the whole industry, which I think is worrying. And I, I think a, a rising in the price of skim milk powder could go some way to a, stopping that. That's very helpful. Uh, we must move on at the moment because uh, we've got a general question now from Jim Hume, which I hope won't take too much time. Um, oh, you might do. <laughs> well, I certainly hope not. Um, no, just uh, I'm, I'm not totally convinced about the, the, the supply and demand uh, argument, to be, on, uh, to be honest, so far. Um, because, well, basically in Scotland by itself, uh, production has stayed fairly stable in, in the last 30 years, according to the facts we have. But I'm just wondering if what we're facing at the moment is a blip because we have heard of uh, the peaks and troughs of supplies and demands and prices throughout the years. We've, we've already uh, know that the Royal Association of British Dairy Farmers think that the, the Russian ban accounts for two to two and a half pence of that litre. That may be something that's not going to be forever. That's their view. Ar Arla have stated that they th there is a a change in the demand growth in China, but there is still a demand growth. It's changed from 10% to 2%. That's still growth. It's not like the market's collapsed from China. So somebody's having, having to take that up. Um, so I'm just really wondering uh, what people's are, views are. Is, uh, is the glass half full or is the glass ha half empty? Is this a blip, medium term, short term, or longer term? If you can survive, um, are, are we maybe looking at a rosier future? Right, so we'll have Judith first, then Graham, and then uh, George. Okay. I mean, we know that demand, global demand for, for dairy is still growing around the world, um, and it's growing around, depending on who you listen to, 2.5% two, two every year, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization in Southeast Asia alone. By 2030, we're going to see a predicted growth of 125% for their desire to consume dairy products. We're aware that that demand will increase in uh, Southeast Asia, in China, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America. These are things that are going to happen in the future as quota ends uh, and as more uh, of the, if you like, milk production in Europe heads north and west towards countries like um, the UK and like Ireland. We have opportunities for the future. So the future of the dairy industry, I don't like to talk the dairy industry into the ground because I think the future for the dairy industry has potential bright spots, but it will always have areas of volatility. 
Chinese farmers at the moment with some of their joint ventures from uh, European countries are seeing their own profit warning. Some of them are throwing away milk, but China still is sitting on a lot of stock and it's using up that stock. And some will say it's using up the stock until the prices drop because of the oversupply of milk. Then they'll come back in. And when they come back in and start sweeping up that supply again of powder, uh, and when some of the production equalises, we will be back on a good footing. And that's why predictions by people like Rabobank say that we will be on the incline again towards the second half of the, the year. Of course, none of us have a crystal ball. And, and given what happened last year, um, we're loath to make too many predictions. But we do think that the future for the industry is bright and global demand is increasing. It's just that we have so much excess production in 2014 that it's, it's difficult because it's still outstripping. I mean, from our own organisational perspective, I'm bringing in EDA Congress here, European Congress. I'm bringing the European dairy industry to Edinburgh in October to talk about... Um, British dairy and investing in British dairy. So, you know, we, we definitely don't want to talk the industry into the ground. We recognise all the hardships. I have 200 members. Most of them will be um, small to medium members. Some of them are the very large members who are the household names. All across the bar board, from farmers to processors, it's tough out there at the moment, but the future's bright. Sorry, that took a while. <laughs> well, it's... it's uh... Being precise is very helpful, but it's uh, important for us to understand the detail. Um, Graham Jack, followed by George Jameson. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give you our take. I, th I think the answer to Jim's question is certainly short-term pain, um, but medium to long-term optimism uh, for this industry. So to try to quantify um, or put some metrics around the short-term pain, the, the impact of the ramping up of milk production in the in the UK over the past year, I guess a statistic that uh, struck me was that every week there's an additional 825 farm milk tankers worth of milk being produced in the UK each year, every week. Um, it's an awful lot of milk. And quite simply, in the UK, there is not the processing capacity to deal with that volume of milk right now. So by necessity, some of that milk is having to be diverted into these low value base uh, commodities. That's the reality. In the medium to long term, um, I think the reality is that the, the, the Scottish and the British public want to buy products made in Scotland and made in Britain from uh, milk produced by Scottish and, and British farmers. There is, a, a, there is a deficit, as, as, as we mentioned before. I can give you a good example of um, uh, how, how, how that demand can be satisfied. We spent a fair amount of money on a butter plant, um, uh, which, which was commissioned just about a year ago now. And it's now um, working at full capacity. It's about 40,000 tonnes of butter a year it's producing. 30% of that is being exported to places as far afield as North Africa, into Europe, Egypt, and, 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 and so on. So there are, there are, um, there are um, processors out there. I think Arla um, uh, and, and ourselves at a national level, certainly Robert Graham in, in, in Scotland, um, are investing uh, uh, because there is an opportunity. But I don't think any processor can, can buck a market. Um, and we're having to deal with a severe overproduction uh, and, and, and a, a, a weakening in, in demand. And, and I understand your cynicism, Jim, but the reality is the value of these commodities has collapsed. You know, the, the returns are not there. Um, uh, and that's the, the short-term reality that we've got to work through at the moment. So I, I, we would, uh, certainly as a company, we would err on the side of um, optimism uh, and ambition for the UK um, dairy industry, because that's how we see it. Right, so um, we must uh, try and be precise and not, uh, you know, continually repeat uh, issues about investment and so on, the details of which we've got quite clearly now. Uh, so, George Jameson. Yeah, I agree with everything Judith says, so that will save a lot of words. I, I think there is general optimism. 
I don't like the word blip, no offence, but George Eustace used that and it infuriated me. And if you speak to Robert and Kenny, this is, this is not a blip. This is a long period of very low prices that needs exceptional measures taken, I believe. Then we will get the benefit of all the, the, the prospects that Judith has mentioned. So this is more than a blip. This, this is really serious. And to use the word blip, as George Eustace did, was a wee bit, a, from him, a wee bit disrespectful to the farmers having a really hard time. On the extra 800 tankers, I, I agree to a certain extent, but this is not the biggest milk production year we've had in, in UK history. And, and in May and June, we had something like 42 million litres a day, and now we're down at 37 million litres a day. I was suggesting there is processing capacity, it's just that we don't have that in the right markets, because the extra milk that an individual company can't handle has been put onto the spot market, and there's nobody picking that up to add value to it. So I don't think it's the extra milk that's the problem. It's our inability to put it into products that have got a strong market, and, and there's definitely potential for that. In terms of going forward, just to finish off quickly, the way forward is to develop more collaboration between farmers and processors and marketers. I'm repeating myself, but that is the absolute key to it all. And, and the code of practice is fundamental to that, if, if everybody would buy into that code of practice. And if it's not as people want it, then ch well, we'll change it. But we need to get that collaboration forward, because the countries that are successful in this world have been collaborative. Your Friesland campaigners, your Arles, your Fonterras, there's collaboration. Now, that doesn't need to be co-ops. It can be PLCs that work well with the farmers. Thanks. Uh, Nigel, followed by Robert Graham, followed by Claudia Beamish. Okay, we'll move on. Again, and a bit of colour around these. When you start looking at, uh, as Graham said, increased production coming through the marketplace, you've got tankers of milk floating around, where does it go? It does not go into added value markets. It does not go into markets that are existing at reasonable value. It goes straight to the bottom of the market, and that's the issue. Um, does that change rapidly? On the downside, it does not. It actually, sorry, that's wrong. What I mean is that on the downside, when the market's on the way down, it drops incredibly rapidly. When the market starts rising, it rises very slowly. In fact, you could argue that it rises as, twice as slowly as it falls, and that creates a problem. And the issue is, is how long does it stay down? Because that ultimately affects the sustainability of anybody in this industry. Because the longer it stays down, the harder it is. Will it go up again? Yes, it absolutely will. And I think the long-term price trend for the industry is upwards. But the peaks, each peak will be higher than the last, and each trough will be slightly lower than last. But that volatility that we've seen of a 40 to 50% drop in price, I think, is here to stay because of the lack of support in the marketplace. OK. Um, we have uh, Robert Graham and then Claudia Beamish. Just agreeing with a lot of what George says about farmers and processors working um, closely together. We have to work in terms of increasing milk production, increasing sales. We do need more investment in more products. For us, uh, our 90 farmers on average were up 9% on milk from the year before, which is 10 Arctic loads of milk a week, 30, 300,000 litres of milk. So we have to work closely. I've heard voluntary code mentioned a few times. And voluntary code... OK. Just I'll leave it in. But on, in, in terms of uh, commodity markets, we have seen um, markets tend to overcorrect at the top, maybe overcorrect at the bottom. Lots of talk about farmers. And commodity markets were high. Lots of commodity markets, that's the, way, that's the place to be. Some farmers were encouraged to join. I think a lot of them to go into uh, First Milk as not as co-op members, but as commodity contract suppliers. A lot of them now come end of March because they're not needed now as commodity, don't have a business. And that's concerning. We have to keep focused on what we're trying to do, which is add, add value. Commodity markets will correct, but I think in terms of the opportunities, for it's butter or cheese, yogurts, there's, there's a lot to go at, and, and we, we as a business just want a chance to be able to crack on with that. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a quick question. Um, it's actually a question for Judith, uh, which is, um, uh, I'm seeking reassurance in the medium and longer term. You seem fairly confident, if I'm reading you right, that the Chinese market's going to improve, and I wonder really what you're basing that on. Some economists would say that there's a lot of question marks over that. If we're talking global, I think it's very dangerous to be, if I may be frank, making statements about the future, you know, without when there, there are people arguing on each side. 
For sure, as I said when I talked, none of us have a crystal ball, and I, we, after what happened last year, we can't predict. But what we have to do is look at what other people who are in the business of predicting are predicting. Now, as I said, the Chinese have had profit warnings with some of their JBs. Some Chinese farmers are throwing their milk on the ground, but the Chinese also have a large number of stocks that they're progressively using up. And Rabobank and others who are in the business of analysing what China is doing and looking at how their stocks are and looking at when they might come back in have given a prediction for the second half of 2015. We absolutely think that the next few months are going to continue to be difficult. We've seen some very small positive signs. I wouldn't bet my house on the small positive signs. But I do think that we have to recognise the fact that Milk is an aspirational product in lots of countries. There is global growth. Uh, not only are new lives coming into the world and as economic situations improve, do people want more dairy. Uh, we also have a growing ageing population where there are opportunities for the dairy industry. And the growth, we, we need to maintain the consumption in the UK. The massive growth will be in other areas of the world. But we do see a, fr a bright future for dairy from the predictions that we're seeing from those who do the analysis. Okay, thank you. Okay, final point of this from Jim Hume. It was just just to sum up the question that, that sort of sta started off. What's coming out? Uh, it's come out from Graham. It's come out from Robert. Uh, it's come out from George's. The, the lack of capacity for processing uh, milk is not just milk. It can be many many things. But if you can't make it into many things, then then that that causes that problem for that liquid milk. So that's just really what for me came out of that question quite strongly. Okay. Uh, sorry, James. <laughs> you said reluctantly, Rob. Um, I think just one thing on the global, um, and, and I don't know if Nigel meant it this way, that the peaks are going to go higher and the troughs are going to go lower. I think that's true in the global market, but I think it's, for me, important that we don't think that's Scotland's destiny. You know, I think that's a roller coaster, but we can get off that. So I don't see a future where we'll be exporting a huge amount of products to China. Aside from the fact we don't, even if we exported all our cheese, we'd barely feed a suburb of Shanghai. Um, I think our opportunity are in, are in the really uh, targeted, really targeted markets. And that's where there are models of other sectors that have done that well. Salmon's a good example. They're not, in China, they're not competing with Norway at retail level. They've gone at the really top end hotel chains. You know, a few Shangri-Las, Ritzes in top end China, and that's where they've gone because that's the amount of product they've got. So... I think this global up and down will happen. I just don't, I don't think that's Scotland's future at all. I think we can get off that, uh, the, the global peaks and troughs, by really targeting that premium end, which will hold up even in the uh, uh, toughest of markets. Well, we're going to have to be able to support our producers in the meantime, you know, uh, because we're not aiming at the kind of cheese in America where it's only for pizzas or for burgers, and we are in the quality end of that. So, yes, we will explore that in due course. But uh, in terms of the problem facing us just now, we've got a voluntary code of practice introduced in 2012, agreed that it should continue in 2014, 85% of UK milk production is covered by the code. But, you know, should this continue as a voluntary code? Um, are there producers, processors, retailers not covered by the code? Uh, and in the light of recent experience, are further changes in the code needed? Robert, Graham. <laughs> voluntary code, <clears throat> we have a, a huge issue with it. I think... We look at, as a family business, and, and a family business starting, when I started, there was less people working in the business and sit at this table, a dairy, a fraction of the size of this room. We compete against, uh, private, our private business, we compete against co-ops, both in the market and for supply of milk. And we have co-ops co like Arla, who are behemoths at 25 billion globally, who pay a European price, but they still pay two pence a litre less than we do, and we compete against them on contracts that we will, be, we will be tendering for this year. But a voluntary code that is biased towards co-ops against private businesses. So in terms of whether it's a first milk or an Arla, they, um, they, they, they bias against family businesses, against Scottish businesses. A Danish-based co-op has the ability to hold on to our farmers for 12 months according to voluntary code, but I could only keep mine for three months in terms of notice. And that brings a whole lot of 
challenges and in terms of how do we maintain our, supply, our supplier base. And of course, we pay, pay a great price and they deal with us personally. But I think it, 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 is, it is not right where that bias can be in place. It's not right where we have and with first milk fallover challenges and, and obviously huge importance to peripheral areas where we have such a massive difference in PPL terms and capital levy, yet farmers can't leave with less than 12 months' notice. They can't get their capital money back for goodness knows how long. So I think, for me, there's, it is not fair, not fair, but a, but a private family business that works hard should be predicated against by voluntary code. Um, Graham Jack. Next, Nigel Evans and then Robert McIntyre. Right. Yeah, um, our business in terms of uh, how, how we feel about the code is uh, some similarities uh, there. The voluntary code is a source of some frustration uh, to us. Um, we comply with the spirit and the intent of the voluntary code. Um, we give our farmers one month's notice of any price change. And if farmers are unhappy, um, they can give us 12 weeks notice and, and they can move to another, another buyer. Um, so our, our contract is characterised by simplicity and, and flexibility. It's as, it's as simple as that. Uh, but yet it seems to be acceptable um, in, in the UK dairy industry that farmer cooperatives um, are able to send their members uh, new prices by text with two or three days' notice, um, and that they, they, they're able to uh, insist on 12 months' notice if a farmer is unhappy with that. And we don't see that as a level playing field. It is a matter of some frustration. We've decided that we will continue with our, uh, um, uh, with our, with our approach because it's part of our, our offering. Um, in a Scottish context, we, we have 263 farmers supplying us um, we had 23 new starts in the year up until April the 1st, 2014. I suspect we would have had considerably more than that had that freedom of movement been uh, applied across the industry. Um, so that's... Thank you. Uh, that's helpful. Nigel Evans, uh, Robert McIntyre, Jameson. I think the code has been useful because it's brought a lot of issues out into the open and um, everybody's dealt with them. Um, I think from our perspective, is it, is it perfect? No, it isn't because, you know, there are elements of it that actually cause the business difficulties and one of the ones has been the fact that we do announce a price at least 30 days before we implement it. Actually, but then again, you know, by the time when you're in a falling market situation, having to do that actually creates difficulties because trying to match income against what you're actually paying gets quite difficult because quite often we're up to 10, 12 weeks out by the time we've got cash in from the, the milk we've paid for. To answer uh, both the criticisms about the, or the comments, I should say, around the, the sort of 12 weeks worth versus the 12-month rule, I mean, that was an e in EU... Um, agreed function that should sit within the code and why does it sit there why was that need felt to be uh, of, of use to farmers a co-op is owned and managed by its members and we have a governance structure that allows members to actually uh, appoint people to the board and to have a say in how the business is run and also it is farmers ultimately that are helping to set the price within that business when you have a private company doing that, farmers don't have any insight um, or capability of influence in that. They are simply given or dictated a price. Now, that actually creates a differential in terms of how you should leave or not leave. I mean, and again, we, have, we do actually put cash into the business as farmers. And again, we have a right to sort of control that, et cetera, et cetera. We don't tip up at a uh, um, Mellow Wiseman meeting or, or a, a Graham's meeting, board meeting, and we don't have any say in terms of how that business is run. Yet within First Milk, farmers actually control the business. So that was the understanding why there should be a differential in terms of uh, leave-in terms. Uh, Graham Day on that point. Uh, just just an a obvious observation. Yeah. That may well be the case, but both of these two companies are paying a better rate than you are at the moment. So perhaps it works better with I them. I think the operative word there that you just used is at the moment. Mm. 
And I think it's, again, when you look at prices, and when you look at prices over periods of time, mm -hmm. you see a lot more commonality of pricing. That, that's the truth of the matter. There will always be situations, because of product mix, different mm -hmm. markets that each company works in, that there's going to be differentials, differential in pricing. And I think, just as you use as an example, if you, if you take skim milk powder pricing, which is currently, as we've talked about this morning, trading at a price equivalent of 14 pence a litre, and yet 12 months ago that was trading at a price that was near 40 pence a litre. And that has a substantial impact on the pricing that different elements of the market will have. So if, if I may, Kavina, so if we were to look back over the last three years and analyse the price that was being paid by the private companies set against the cooperatives, are you telling me the cooperatives would be performing better in how they were responding to their members or worse? Uh, in terms of our pricing relative to our mm. competitors, yeah, we'd be respond we'd be, we would be performing a lot better. Okay. Right, well, we'll find out. Analysis, convener. Uh, well, it would be a good idea, yes. We could do with some of these figures talking about transparency, yep. just to have the last two or three years in that fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert McIntyre, and then George Jameson, finally, on this point. <coughs> well, and back to what Jim Hume said about utilising the capacity we do have in Scotland. Um, I was glad to hear Nigel say today that they're going to proceed with the new vats and the new boilers and really the refurbishment of Campbellton Creamery. And I'm told by farmers in Kintyre, who I'm very friendly with, that Campbellton Creamery could utilise 80 million litres a year. Once it's, uh, it could, it's got the capacity for that. So given that there's 30 million litres a year being produced in Kintyre, Take the 15 million litres of the island of Butte, take it down and start making Isle of Butte cheese again. Because it was a winner and then it was stopped in its tracks in 1920. Six years ago it was. So you're going to have a facility there that can produce a, a magical name like Mull of Kintyre and another magical name like Isle of Butte. And you'll have the the place to, to utilise and make the top quality cheese, so I urge you to do that. Okay, um, George Jameson. Yeah, on the code, uh, I had the dubious pleasure of being involved in the high-level working group, the dairy package, and then the code. The dairy package identified two key issues. One was producer organisations, more collective uh, sort of power for farmers, another was compulsory contracts. Now, Jim Pace and the industry decided they didn't want compulsory contracts. Now, the reason for that was there was minimum requirements within that compulsory contract that, that they were quite uncomfortable with because it effectively meant zero days' notice on both parties, which we asked government to look at to see if that could be made more flexible. But be that as it's made, Jim Pace at the time decided they would go for a voluntary code, and all parties willingly came to the table, including Dare UK, NFU, and NFU Scotland, and there was six people, sadly, that sat through that for 14 months, and we had a huge amount of discussion going back and forward and back and forward. One thing I would say that there's far too much emphasis placed on the three-month termination clause, far too much, because you've got a good working relationship. That's not necessary. Wiseman Dairies have had a three-month contract from the word go, and you've got one of the best retention policies of anybody. Lactalis, similarly. They didn't need to change that. Dairy Crest, another private company, had 12 months. They switched to three months almost immediately to sign the contract. It's not hurt them. It's helped them. Because what has developed within Dairy Crest is an independent farmer organisation that will be applying for PO. Now, Dairy Crest have benefited from that independent farmer organisation because it's funded by the farmers. They have full-time members of staff who understand the dairy industry, can sit beside the Dairy Crest executives and discuss things like the formula that they've developed. Now, the big on pass, as Judith will agree with me, is the difference between the co-ops and the PLCs. On the subject of prices, if you look at Friesland, Campina and Arles prices, they tend to be amongst the best in Europe consistently. And the Arla price in the UK has been higher than everybody else's. It's now lower because it's a European price and it's dropped with that European context. Now, the big issue, the high-level working group on compulsory contracts exempted co-ops because only, and only, and, and it was NFE Scotland that pushed this in Europe, only if they could pass a governance audit. 
We wanted co-ops to be co-ops and prove that they were co-ops, in other words, run by the farmers. NFU Scotland got the job with the code to audit the co-ops, and they did so willingly, and we spent days with the executives and the farmers of Arla and the co-ops. I'm not pro-co-op or, or pro-PLC. I'm totally objective, because this code is not being used as effectively as it can be. Now, when Alex chaired the review process, we went through this in great depth, but both Arla and First Milk have a governance structure that gives the farmers the ability to set pricing and set pricing mechanisms. On the 30-day notice, I'm not precious about that. Arla set a price every month based on an objective formula agreed by the Council of Representatives, which are all farmers. That mechanism can only be slightly changed month on month, but after 12 months, it has to be reconciled with the formula. Now, the farmers of Arla want that monthly reconciliation because it holds management to account. They know that Arla are paying as much as they can, and at 12 months, they have to give everything that the farmers due. It's a farmer decision. If First Milk change their price, it has to go through the board of directors, which is a majority of farmers. Now, it's up that the structures are there, and where I have probably got some criticism, and this goes across PLC groups and co-op groups, is the lack of communication back and forth to members. And that's a real challenge, because we have that challenge as well. But the structure in place for farmers to run both these businesses. Now, within the review process, we looked very hard at how we could help PLCs. Now, in the original code of practice, there is the option. If the farmers democratically say that we would rather have three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, they're perfectly at liberty to do that. So the farmers supplying PLCs can agree with the company to have a longer retention of normal termination clause. And beyond that, we haven't got this into the code yet, but the, we strongly recommended that where PLCs feel they don't need a producer group, then when the farmer signs the contract, there has to be a clear understanding that the farmer fully understands what he's signing up to and that the company has to say they have made the farmer fully aware of what he's signing up to. Because many farmers, especially in 2013 when there was real competition for milk, there was a desperation. It was like buying a new car. You know, and they signed the contract without looking at it. And he may say, well, hell mend them, but that's where we are. So we would like a clause in that contract where if there's no producer group and a farmer signs up, they know very clearly that this is a 12-month contract. So there's clarification there. So there's ways through this, and I don't think it's helpful for companies to nitpick at other companies and things like that. The co-op is a derogation because the farmers can dictate in a PLC, it's discretionary, it's discretionary pricing. So Robert can change the price without consulting with his farmers. And that works, for, as he says, and, and there's historical evidence that he pays a decent <laughs> price. So his farmers will generally be happy. So we need to get through this on pass. And there's a way through it if folk will just see that this is a benefit. The, the opening lines of the code of practice was to improve supply chain relationships for all parties, and that is crucial. OK, um, I have to ask then, you know, would it be possible for the Scottish Government to introduce a compulsory contract uh, in Scotland? If so, should it? Uh, and if not, should it call on the UK Government to do so? Because we've reached a point of another crisis and one of many. George. It's, quite, it's quite a technical detail. I'll let Judith speak on this as well. But the, the, the technicality is that the member states can opt for a compulsory contract and there's a very clear minimum standards of that contract. Now, we've asked DEFRA to do an impact assessment on that because we don't believe it's as bad as, it's, as, it, as it, it may appear. But the, the fear, and Judith can correct me if I'm wrong, is that as it stands in that European dairy package, if a price change is at all, that price change has to be negotiated. And until that time, and, and the contract is broken. What we, if, if we went down the line of compulsory contracts, we would like an impact assessment done first. But we'd far prefer that the voluntary code worked. But if there was an impact assessment done and there was some flexibility in that, we would argue that on a price change, yes, there must be negotiation. But it doesn't mean the contract's broken. It only means that clause is to be renegotiated. That's what I would want to ask of the Commission. Okay, thank you for that. 
Judith, yeah. If we look at the idea of a compulsory code, as George has said, there are things within the EU package which are, are a minimum. DEFRA has consistently uh, interpreted what's in the EU package to mean that every time there's a change, a new contract has to be given over. And in a time where there's an oversupplied market, that would actually mean lack of security for the farmer. There could be farmers losing contract because a new contract would have to be put in place. So actually a compulsory code could be counterproductive. Okay, uh, Alec Ferguson. Uh, uh, just, just to add to that, convener, if I may, very briefly, uh, the, the beauty, in my view, of the code remaining voluntary is that it allows the word George used, flexibility, to be maintained within the parties negotiating a contract. And that flexibility does also allow any PLC, be it family company or otherwise, to negotiate 12-month contracts with their producers if they wish to do so. So I, I'm... I'm I've, I've discussed this with Robert Graham in the past, but I'm, I'm not totally convinced by his accusation of bias, which I think is a little bit strong, because the flexibility within the code uh, allows um, differentiations of contract to be negotiated. That's part of the beauty of it, and I think that would be under threat. That flexibility would be under threat if the code would become compulsory, in my opinion. Well, we'll mull over these sort of things. Uh, Dave Thompson. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Convener. Just a very small point. I, I notice that 12 member states have gone down the road of uh, compulsory contracts. I just wonder if there's any evidence that they are doing better or worse because of that. Maybe it's something that uh, we could get a bit more information on. I don't know if anyone around the table just Does now anyone have has any information, any information on, that, on that? the 12 countries that have got uh, compulsory contracts? Um, to see what was happening, and, and they all seem to have interpreted things slightly differently. Um, but at the end of the day, what's clear is that the code as it stands was never put in place to address the pricing issue, and no compulsory code that would be put in place could address the pricing issue or volatility. Fine. Thank you for that. Dave Stewart, you have a question, I think. Yeah, th thank you, Convener. Um, earlier uh, this morning, we touched on how we develop an export market for uh, Scottish milk. Can I ask the panel if they can perhaps give us more detail on that specific point? <coughs> James Ruther. So, almost exactly a year ago, a new export strategy was launched for Food and Drink in Scotland. Um, it was a product of a partnership with, um, through Scotland Food and Drink with uh, most of the main trade associations covering seafood, salmon, bakery, um, red meat, dairy were involved as well, whiskey association were involved as well uh, in determining what our priority markets would be. Uh, Fifteen key markets were identified and in the top seven of them, um, which were uh, North America, France, Germany, Middle East, Japan, Hong Kong, stroke China, and then Singapore, Southeast Asia. Um, new dedicated food and drink specialists will be put on the ground. Uh, and that was done following the model of other countries that have been doing that for years, like New Zealand, like Ireland, uh, like Scandinavia. Um, the delivery model is through Scottish Development International. Uh, Scottish uh, Government Ministers put money in, SDI put money in, and the industry bodies put uh, money into the tune of about uh, £400,000 over a five-year plan. Um, the team of 10 specialists, which builds on six that already are in existence, are being phased in over a two-year period. So their job is very simple. They don't sell products, but their job is to build the relationships across retailers, across the food service sector, across the supply chain distributors and importers, um, to look for opportunities to develop exports. Um, the seven markets were identified because they had the most cross-sectoral opportunity across seafood, salmon, whiskey, so building Scotland as a brand overseas. Um, but in a number of those markets, there's real opportunities on dairy. And as I mentioned earlier on, the first two of the new specialists who are on the ground in Canada and Tokyo uh, are specifically looking at dairy opportunities um, at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, did anyone else have a point in here? Are there subsequent questions about this? Mike Russell? Yes, <coughs> it does seem to me that this is pretty near the hub of the matter. If we are going to have a sustainable future for the Scottish dairy industry, then it has to <coughs> speak to the same quality of production and quality of product as other successful 
Scottish food and drink industries. It doesn't seem to me that we'll be able to compete in volume because by definition we are a small country and no matter how big our output, it's not going to compete in volume terms. So I just want to know from those who are actually doing it what they are you know, specifically doing to make sure that the, the quality and the niche nature of this product is being promoted in international markets. I mean, that goes for processors. Uh, you know, I'd be keen to hear what their role is and also how that relates to the domestic market because I'm you know, again struck by uh, Robert's uh, submission that you know, getting a, a strong presence in the domestic market is part of, of solving this problem. And it seems to me that neither getting that domestic position and nor um, getting an international position appear to have been prioritised, for example, by First Milk. So I'd be keen to hear what's happening. Well, Robert Graham first. <coughs> I think it's a, it's a bit, talking about um, milk and football sounds some, in the same sentence is a bit weird, but I think it's, it's <clears throat> for me it's a bit like football in that we have to win home games. And winning home games... And looking, as obviously I'm talking particularly about spreadable butter, there's 150 tonnes of spreadable butter a week being sold in Scotland that isn't Scottish. We've got to win these home games. The num number one cheddar cheese brand is not Scottish in Scotland. It should be Scottish. How do we win that? And that's about steps in investment and processing capacity, the right type of capacity in terms of investing in NPD and investing in marketing. And these, are, these are all big numbers, but I think we have to win the home games. How do we get the, the, the relevance? How do we have the products? How do we um, also identify the products that consumers are going to be buying in three, five, ten years' time? One of the products that's fast in fastest growth and the chilled cabinets just now is chilled coffees. You get it in supermarkets and they come from Switzerland and, De and Denmark. So how do we identify that? Winning home games, being relevant, making sure retailers are making, make, giving us as Scottish companies the right enough space on... Scottish shelves for retailers taking your spreadable butter because it is cheaper or because it's Scottish or because people ask for it all three? Well, well I think for, as a business, we, we have people buy a product because it's Scottish, people buy it because it's family, people buy it because it's a farming business. How we will compare against the brand leader is we will be more affordable, which is good as well. So I think it comes across all <coughs> getting that shelf space for any company, in, both in Scotland. And having the, the retailers giving us the right space, enough space, making sure we get access to promotional activity, that brands don't get wiped out with a UK national overlay from a cheese brand and that's all that sells when that's on, is important. How do we get relevance going into England? You go to an English supermarket, you could buy Welsh butter, Irish butter, French butter, Danish butter, lots of Danish butter. And English butter, but you can't buy Scottish butter. But you can buy, you can buy, you can buy all of those again in Scotland. But I think winning home games, but export is important. I think there's a huge amount volume-wise to go for in Scotland for kickoff, and it's right in our doors. But export is important, and it's how do we? And, and I've been to Shanghai um, and Tokyo and, and seen what the opportunities are. But it all takes it's, it takes time. And it's not just about time. It's also what we do for NPD and having the right products right products and maybe with some of the products we make now we might need to be slightly slightly changed maybe different packaging we need to go more slightly, slightly more super premium from even what, what we make and we make some great products so it's, it's not just about the time being out in the sales team it's actually what we do from a product development point as well sorry okay uh, Jim Hume yeah. no, no, it's, it, I've mentioned before about um, New Zealand and uh, also of course be, being an island New Zealand's well, two islands stuck out in the middle of the Pacific, but they've, their uh, dairy exports have grown rapidly from about two billion New Zealand dollars in 1990 to about 16 billion uh, New Zealand dollars uh, uh, with the recent uh, figures. A lot of that has been in, into uh, China, China. The Chinese imports of uh, powder milk from New Zealand have went from, in the last 10 years, from about about zero to about three and a half billion US dollars. Sorry for mixing up the dollars there, but that's just what's the stats in front of me. Now, I heard what James saying that, you know, we must just uh, talk about going for premium project pro uh, uh, products, and that's absolutely right. We should, of course, go for premium products, but how come a small island stuck out in, in the middle of the Pacific with half the population of Scotland has done so well where, where we haven't? Okay. <laughs>
simple answer. Um, yes, um, Graham D. Thank you, Kavira. Just a supplementary. Um, when we're talking about the domestic market, which is obviously hugely important, can I ask how optimistic, and I ask this against the backdrop of our hopefully having the supermarkets in front of us next week, how optimistic the panel members who have any experience of dealing with supermarkets are that they would play ball in this regard? Because I, every time I walk into a supermarket, I see essentially two brands of cheese heavily promoted, given the, premium, the, the prime um, shelf locations in these stores. I really wonder how confident you would be that they will be receptive to promoting high-quality Scottish cheese. Um, I, think, I think from what we see from retailers, and it, it, there is a variance. Some, are, some have big local Scottish teams, some of we don't have such big local Scottish teams. Um, and it, they do realise it's important to be supporting Scottish produce, but it, it, it varies. It varies from diff some, some retailers have got big teams, some retailers are really on it, giving them good displays, giving local teams lots of um, authority, and maybe some, some are less so. I think the, it's about what a consumer wants, but I think also the government making sure that the retailers realise just keep it relevant, keep it front of mind that it's important to our whole economy that they are giving us enough oxygen. I've got a couple of points to make, I think, uh, from uh, people who want to go back to the uh, grocery code adjudicator and, and uh, producer organisations. So, uh, Claudia Beamish, was there anything further on producer organisations that we needed to ask? Uh, just briefly, yes. Yep. Um, I mean, uh, uh, George, you've covered, uh, you've, you've touched on um, producer organisations, but um, I'd like to get the views of the panel on um, the comments by... Um, the UK government, which I uh, quote, believes that forming a producer organisation could give dairy farmers uh, greater clout in the marketplace, and the farming minister suggested that producer organisations might help the imbalance in the market, um, in which a small number of major retailers are the significant buyers, but the majority of sellers are comparatively small-scale producers. Um, and uh, also the Scottish Government has highlighted um, support in 2012 um, in, um, in, in a five-point dairy action plan and said there that um, they sought to ensure that the Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society, um, commonly known as SOAS, um, have sufficient resources to accelerate their existing work on producer organisations <coughs> and, and co-ops. And I'm just wondering if there are comments um, from uh, anyone in the panel about the the, the clout of producer organisations um, beyond what you've already said, George? Well, we've heard that producer organisations are an important part of this, but uh, yeah, if there are specific points on this matter about POs, that would be helpful. Yep. Do, J Judith? To comment, thank you, Convener. We, we haven't uh, seen a vast interest initially um, when the, the ability to put uh, producer organisations together came into play and I think that was because the, it was the difficulties around making them a legal entity and the red tape and the reporting that would have been involved and, and how they would have had to have worked through um, the RPA. In, we know that there are about six organisations at the moment who are getting close to uh, registering as producer organisations, whether they will or they won't is a matter for the future, but we, we know that they have been considering that and looking at it. In terms of countries where there are more producer organisations uh, around and on the ground and have been on the ground for a while, I guess they haven't been on the ground long enough to see if they've been of any benefit in terms of what's happening at the moment in the global market. But what, from what we can see, those countries where the producer organisations exist they're not really doing any better on the milk price just at the minute. Maybe that's because there hasn't been time to assess and there haven't been enough volatility cycles, but we haven't seen a benefit at the minute. Okay. Uh, George Jameson, briefly. The idea of the petition organisations came up in the high-level working group, and it was a basic, very fundamentally, just get farmers together. The issue is a little bit more complicated in, in the UK because we already had a number of producer groups. And Miller Wiseman had a, a well-established producer group. Dairy Crest had them, and there was, there was producer groups. 
the uncertainty about POs was, was the legislation, and although the high level working group in the dairy pack has identified that POs should be introduced, there was very little guidance. Uh, there was a real uncertainty of just we knew the scale they could grow to, but we didn't know really the terms of reference, and it wasn't until DEFRA and the RPA worked out a, a terms of reference. There's a fear amongst farmers to, to join a producer organisation that just handles supply, because in a situation like this, they've nowhere to sell it. The idea was you'd have enough milk and you could have several customers and you could organise that, that sales. Where POs will probably grow in this country is a bit like the Dairy Crest Direct operation when there already is a producer group and there's a trust in that producer group. But RPA agreed that, that we could basically write your own criteria as long as it covered what the Europe wanted. So at the very base, you could have a producer group that applied to be a PO, but they would agree only to deal with the company, the one company, and the contracts, crucially, would remain between <coughs> the farmer and the company. But Dairy Crest Direct, the benefit of PO is professionalism. It's not just about how, many, how much milk you pull together, but it's professionalism. It's having people employed to represent the farmers that can sit down meaningfully with the processes and agree common actions, including volume control. You know, if, if Dairy Crest Direct, for example, of all these members, they could say to all the farmers, look, everybody dry thin cows off, everybody cull cows with mastitis, and immediately you could pull back 5% without having any effect on that Jap's business 12 months down the line. So the benefit for POs for me is not leverage, it's just having a more professional farmer representation that can deal better with processor. Okay, um, Robert Graham. It is important for farmers and uh, process to work together. I am concerned about work with producer um, POs as a farmer business. Our, our first two farmers joined in 1994 and the feel of that relationship sitting around the kitchen table in front of the AGA uh, is very important to us then. It's very important how we keep that for 90 um, farmers, 90 families that we work with. And having that direct connection between us as a family and my father as the family business and them as farmers and not through different farm liaison people or PO liaison people is really important to our business because it's about family, whether it's about farmers, people working in the business, our customers, that they can actually phone us directly, not going through some legislated or something structure, which is, takes away from that really important feel about our business and our relationship with them. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Jim. I just wondered if anybody wanted to address the point that, that I made about you know, New Zealand and how it's been that successful in marketing its products briefly. Yes. In New Zealand, exports 85% of its milk, as does Ireland. In New Zealand, they took the subsidies away overnight, and the government, crucially, allowed Fonterra to grow to an enormous size, so they ever basically had total control over that. They also invested heavily in the markets in powder. You know, New Zealand tariff negotiation with China is massively advantageous because the New Zealanders, being good salesmen, convinced the Chinese that there's no milk powder like the New Zealand milk powder. And to be fair, it is probably better than American milk powder. So they, they put the infrastructure in place, the farmers became efficient, they, they, they're all in the same production pattern, the process and investment in skim milk powder in particular, where the market was, they built that. In Ireland, it's largely co-ops. The Irish Dairy Board do a fantastic job. 85% of the Irish milk is exported. And all the wee co-ops have the umbrella of the Irish Dairy Board that looks after the majority of their marketing. Now, the Irish Dairy Board have got hundreds of young folk out selling Ireland and Irish products. Yes. We're behind the curve with that. It's not to say we can't get there. But they, <coughs> both these countries have, have majored on skim milk powder. But interestingly, both these countries now, as James is referring to, are now looking at, at markets there. But we need to diversify. We need added value. So there's all sorts of joint ventures going about to try and get the, get the cream as well as the, as, as the cake in these countries. And that's a lesson for us all. You know, we relied on our liquid. We need to get out there and sell other products as well. Thanks. I thought that would be an answer, but that was useful. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> one of the answers. Um, not, they're not equally similar answers, but marketing is obviously very important. Mike Russell and then Graham Jack. There's another similarity which has been discussed here, which is worth thinking about. Though the 
the subsidies thing would not be uh, as, uh, as enthusiastically in, uh, embraced, which w is a focus on local food and drink and the importance of that within the local market. Um, I was there last year, and it is very noticeable how the high-quality local food and drink being sold into a population that's not very different from Scotland. Um, people want to buy New Zealand product. They buy New Zealand product, and they think highly of that product. And that, of course, is also true in Ireland, that there is a fondness for Irish products, and Irish products are marketed in such a way that it is the right thing to buy them. And we do need to learn that lesson in Scotland. Buying Scottish produce actually preserves and develops Scottish jobs. Um, thank you for that. Graeme, Jack, just to round this little bit off, because of two pick more up, questions. Sorry, I just wanted to pick up a, a, a point there on the, the Irish and the New Zealand um, uh, markets. They don't have the opportunities within their own home domestic markets that I think we do in Scotland uh, uh, and the, in the UK. Um, export certainly has its place, but... Um, I think there's a big impact that can be made by taking care of and nurturing our, our home market. Uh, I do sometimes feel that the whole notion around exporting is uh, quite sexy and attractive, but you know, need to uh, obviously take care of the, the home front. I think that message is coming through. Um, I, I agree George. with you, Graham, and I agree with you know we have to. We've got a big market here. But in Germany and France, their export on added value is huge, and they've got a massive population, both in these countries. You, you can get the best of both worlds. Export has got to be the added value, the, the cream of the crop, if you like, but yeah. it can be done. Sorry. Okay. But if your home market is controlled by retailers who are often based outside your country, then it leads to the issue that, 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 that Robert has raised. You, know, you can buy um, you know, Irish, English... Um, New Zealand butter in England, but you can't buy Scottish butter. You know, so we have to define this home market issue much more clearly, and we have to work out you know, it is the home market that leads to a Cornish-produced cheddar being the number one seller on Scottish supermarket shelves. So let's talk about home market accurately, and let's promote into the home market in a way that we get an advantage from it. Well, we'll take some of that forward. A question uh, from Angus MacDonald, a patient <coughs> Angus MacDonald. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. You, you mentioned uh, earlier um, yourself the issue of the, the gro Groceries Code adjudicator, uh, Christine uh, Takan. Now, um, we, we've seen discussions recently uh, that the powers of the Groceries Code adjudicator are quite limited, uh, and we know that the House of Commons EFRA Committee uh, recommends changes to remit, including the power to launch proactive investigations. Um, and in the submission from NFUS, um, they, they back that up, uh, in which they say uh, they consider it essential that the GCA is given the power to receive complaints from indirect as well as direct suppliers, uh, as inevitably it's the primary producer who's impacted during periods of volatility. And they go on to say it would also be valuable if the GCA were able to levy fines in cases where unfairness has prevailed in the supply chain. Um, now, I'd be interested to hear the panel members' views uh, as to whether they agree that the, the groceries court adjudicators' remit and powers uh, should be improved uh, or increased, and um, any ideas of how that could happen, how, how we could go about that. Thank you. Okay. We will eventually be speaking with the grocery, uh, uh, with uh, Stack on, uh, possibly at the end of next week. So, uh, you know, it's very relevant to us to know some of your views about that just now. If anyone would like to kick off on the grocery adjudicator? Right, Judith? Oh, well, I suppose from, um, from where I sit, I don't see an awful lot of farmers who are direct suppliers to retailers. Um, and therefore, extending her powers to me, it sounds very nice, but it's quite nebulous. Uh, most of the relationships uh, with the processors, whether they're PLCs or cooperatives, the farmers primary producer already has a mechanism to talk to their um, processor, their, their supplying processor about what's happening in the market and about the price that they're receiving. So we're not entirely clear as to when people talk about extending Christine Tacon's powers exactly what they see her doing. Okay. Uh, anyone else on that point? There, George Jameson? I, mean, I, I take Judith's point, but in a lot of cases, it's the farmer ultimately that suffers. If processors are being unfairly treated by retailers, however well they define unfairly treated, the impact 
inevitably falls on the farmer most of the time because of the, the lowest common denominator. So if processes are getting squeezed, farmers are getting squeezed. So the impact is on the whole industry. So that, and understandably, processors are unwilling to raise issues with retailers because these are huge retailers. You know, if, if you lose a contract, it, it's a major issue. So they're not going to hold their hands up and, and complain. You know. I would like to think there's no complaints needed, <laughs> given that there isn't any. There hasn't been any complaints in the dairy sector since the adjudicator was set up, and that there's clearly some bad practice out there. So something needs to be done to make the adjudicator more relevant. And I would like to highlight the retailers that are doing the good job, doing the right thing, because it's putting pressure on the whole supply chain. You know, milk sold cheaply is fine for a while, but it becomes the norm. And you cannot produce milk sustainably at these low prices, similarly with cheese. So something needs to be done to make the adjudicator more relevant to the whole of the supply chain. Graham Day. Yeah, I, may convene. I want to go back to something I think George Jameson said earlier, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he said something along the lines of retailers were charging for shelf space, if I remember correctly. Um, that would be potentially in contravention of the Grocery Supply Code, because it states... A retailer must not directly or indirectly require a supplier to make any payment in order to secure better positioning or an increase in the allocation of sales space for any grocery products of that supplier within a store unless such payment is made in relation to a promotion. So there is potentially an area where the grocery code adjudicator could get involved. So can I ask the panel if you're aware of breaches of this type actually taking place? Robert McIntyre. To the, the time I was on the board of Scottish Milk, I was also on the board of a company that had Scottish Milk products, which sold the cheese from Arden, Butte and Kintyre Creameries. And we used uh, the Irvins of McClell and Seriously Strong people to sell our, that was a contract. Um, when Scottish Pride went bust, we utilised them to sell our cheese. And they were always on about shell space and having to stump up for shelf space. So unless that has moved in the last five or six years, that, that was very common then. Did George uh, Jameson want to come back on the point that uh, he commented yeah, on earlier? Nobody's going to admit to that. You know, a process is not going to admit that they bought shelf space in the prime location. Um, it's highly unlikely, anyway, because they want that shelf space and they have to buy it, they have to buy it. It's all anecdotal. Uh, similarly, the anecdotal evidence that one of the big supermarkets tendered for a cheese contract, which was worth a lot of money, clearly. And both the companies that were tendering had to pay for the right to tender, and, and they were talking millions. Now, a small company can't do that. Uh, it, it, I don't think that's fair play. Uh, we also hear processors who are maybe going through a thin time and they need the volume through. They'll offer cheese to retailers a knockdown price, which unsettles the market. I mean, all these things are happening, and that's not the retailer's fault. If somebody's offering a cheap cheese, you're going to probably take it. But we would like to see more sustainable contracts for cheese with processors so that they get a longer term contract. I know that's happening, and, and, and that would clarify, it would help the market gain stability as well. But getting back to peripheral milk fields, these small companies are at a real disadvantage if these practices are going on. I was, I was going to say, anecdotal or otherwise, these examples are really important to us because we will have the supermarkets in front of us and we'll be speaking to the groceries code adjudicators. So it's important to have this on the record as much as we can have for us to take forward. So I mean, are other panellists of the same view that this sort of thing is going on? Or is there a wall of silence? I hope not. Something we have pretty much not come across. So maybe the closest we'd have come is some, is some element of listing fee, but it's very... It's been very, very um, small. We do obviously see things, payments around promotional support, and that can vary depending if it's just a UK promotion or if we're promoting products that we do sell full UK wide. Um, so that's our experience. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, just a wrap round question about uh, dairy development, which Alec Ferguson might like to ask just now. Yeah, in, 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 almost in an effort to try and end on a sort of optimistic note, if we possibly can, because um, we've had a fair share of, of, of 
understandable pessimism and, and difficulty raised around the board. But I'm, I'm, I think we're all aware that um, the Scottish Dairy Review produced a report in um, 2013, Ambition 2025, which looked at a virtual doubling of milk production um, by, by, the, by 2025, obviously, um, and also uh, recommended the establishment of a dairy growth board. And really, quite simply, I think my question possibly to the two dairy farmers with us or the two um, dairy farmers is, you know, are you, are you, are you planning to expand uh, in view of these recommendations or are you battening down the hatches? And perhaps somebody could say, what, you know, what has the growth board done? What's, what's happened since it was, it was put forward? Kenneth? Speak personally, of course, yeah. Alex. Uh, I remain entirely enthusiastic about dairy farming and, and, and uh, would very much like to, to expand my business. I think there's, a, there's obvious uh, environmental restrictions with, with land. You can't milk cows without land. And we've seen great growth in herd sizes over the last generation or so. I think there's a limit to how big these herds can go not so much for producing the, the, the food for these cows, but it's getting, get, getting rid of the, the slurry at the other, the other end. Uh, you know, there's great costs involved in hauling uh, something with such a low dry matter uh, any great distance. Uh, but in, in principle, I think we will continue to see the average size of the dairy herd in the, in the UK. I, I, can't remember, I don't know how many years it's taken to double, but... It will double again, there's no question about that, and probably just as quickly as it doubled the last time. And uh, I would certainly like to be part of that, but uh, I can't see me spending a whole lot in the next six months. I can tell. Yes, um, we took the decision last year when my son decided to come home after being away working in a different, a different job um, to... We had to expand. We were fortunate enough to get extra land from Beauty States to make the farm uh, around 260 all grass acres. And of course, we went out and to immediately get going, we purchased some extra cows. That went on the overdraft. We made extra, we put up a, an extension to our cubicle shed. All these things went on the overdraft. We did a four year budget with the SEC which he uh, based it on a price of 30 pence a litre. So you can see that budget's been blown to hell now. And um, to a reasonable amount, I mean, we were only going from 80 to 100 cows, and we look after these cows as if they're, they're part of the family. Um, this, I'm sorry to say, and I'm maybe disagreeing with, Andrew, uh, with Mr. Campbell here, that... What I don't like about the dairy situation is all along the south of Scotland, there's what we in Butte describe as factory farms, where there's cow numbers four, five, six hundred. Poor brutes never see any grass because they're under a roof 365 days a year. Um, we hear stories about these places, but um, I've never been at one. But that's not dairy farming to my mind. That's factory farming. But it's the market, I think you would agree as well. Mm? I think you'd have to agree it is also the market as well. Well, as the expansion in these farms has been startling, and many of them have contributed to the surplus that we can't handle nowadays. Mm. George Jemison won't agree with that, but that's a fact that we think. Okay, well, James Withers first, and then George Jemison. Hoping to end up on an optimistic note here. <laughs> Some hopes. <laughs> Um, just, uh, I'll answer, I think, particularly Alex's question about the Dairy Growth Board and what's happened next, because um, it's, it's an important question. Just quickly by way of context, so the Ambition 2025 talked of um, the potential for a 50% increase in, in production to, to go from 1.1 to 1.6 billion. Um, it's probably important to state that it was never a target. 
uh, and it was whether that figure was going to be used was debated for a while. It was designed as a statement of potential that we should move from talking about managing decline in Scottish day to being optimistic and thinking about growth. Um, the second key point about that 50% growth figure was that it had to be market-driven growth. So it would be suicide to produce more and hope we could find a home for it. It had to be market-driven um, or else we'd end up with a real challenge for some of the reasons we've talked about before. Um, so that's by way of context. The Dairy Growth Board is now established. Uh, it's chaired by Paul Grant, who is the chairman of Mackay's Jams. So that's taking someone from out with the dairy sector who's taken a business from what was producing a commodity into one that's a, obviously a strong brand now. Um, I, I don't know if the committee is looking for any further evidence, but I imagine um, evidence from Paul might be useful in terms of what he's doing. In terms of short-term work, uh, we've seen the launch of the Scottish uh, Dairy Hub, funded by the Dairy Co, the Levy Board, and half by Scottish Government, designed to provide a one-stop shop for farmers looking for advice uh, and support um, there's a requirement for a bit of a culture change in the use of advisors, I think, in, in Scotland compared to where our Scandinavian counterparts uh, would be. This is designed to make that easier. So it's independent. It's not provision of advice from someone who's got something to sell. So no vested interest, just pointing farmers to where the best source of advice might be. That's now up and running. Um, and the second main thing is, that, again, around this international agenda, uh, Paul is working closely um, with a number of Scottish uh, dairy processors looking to enter three to five new markets this year, having done research last year. Um, and fingers crossed, we'd be heading towards the launch of a, a new Scottish dairy brand um, in international markets at the back end of this year, one of the world's uh, big food and drink shows. So the milk bottle half full, and uh, George Jameson, the milk bottle half empty. <laughs> <coughs> Don't quote me on this press, because they'll, they'll accuse me of making excuses again. I repeat, there's potential to grow the dairy industry in Scotland. There's absolutely no doubt about that. If we can market more products at the right value and we get investment in process, and farmers will react. In answer to Robert's criticism, I, I was a farmer for 25 years with 150 cows, and then I was a consultant for a number of years. And I can assure you, there's many, many farmers that have only got 100 cows, 150 cows that are just as efficient as the big guys. I don't like the term factory farmer because I've been on many. I've advised many people that have got 500 cows, 1,000 cows, and these cows are looked after fantastically well. Absolutely fantastically well. Now, there's room for everybody in this industry, and that's what we need to do. There's room for everybody. Just to put it in context, last year we produced... Uh, another hundred, another almost. A, get my figures. We had good weather and we had good prices. Now, one litre a day from the 165,000 animals in Scotland equates to about 500 million litres. That's 50, 40 or 50 new farms. Average herd size rose by four over the 1,000 herds. That's another 300,000 litres. That's where it came from. That's where the extra milk came from. The guys that have grown in the southwest have just taken up the space that others have left for, for, for obvious reasons, mostly economic. But to say there's, we, we, mustn't, we mustn't split the industry between big guys and wee guys because it's about efficiency. It's about being fit for purpose. And small family farms can be incredibly efficient because I was one. Well, we're going to finish up with uh, Nigel Evans just now, and I mean we're going to finish up because we'll have a lot of very interesting reading from the evidence that we've already had before we tackle the next panels next week. Nigel Evans. I, 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 this is as much a comment about the industry and where it's headed in, 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 in Scotland and in the wider UK. And I think it's for us as an industry to... Um, yes, be very positive about the future. We've talked about New Zealand a few times this morning. There are lessons there for us to, to sort of compare ourselves to New Zealand. If you look back at New Zealand 20 years ago, they had a, the removal of subsidies from their market, in fact, just over 20 or 30 odd years ago, nearly. Um, what was the effect of that on that industry? It had a catastrophic short-term effect. It actually caused people to question. A number of people went out of the business. But if you look at that industry over that period of time since, they've actually grown volume of production and value to the New Zealand economy by three times. You know, there is a future out there. It's a very positive future. And I think it's about us as an industry understanding where we add true value. And value is not something that we say it is. It is something that the consumer says it is. It's the customer at the end of the day that determines that value. 
And New Zealand looked at it from the perspective of where is the value? And they went out there and they addressed that market. And that applies to us in this industry in, in, in Scotland and across the wider UK. It is there, it is there for the taking. What are some of the lessons that we can take from it? We've talked about cost of production this morning. Personally, I think a cost of production formula applied to dairy or any other commodity is actually a route to diminution of value, not increased in value. It's because it stifles innovation. And one of the things that you have to look at, and again, what happens across New Zealand and the US, etc., these are not about growing herd sizes and factory farms. It is about the number of people that are employed in the totality within the industry. And that's something I think that we need to look at. And that demands innovation. And that comes from true value creation. My view of this industry is very optimistic. I think there is huge scope up there and huge opportunity to create value. Thank you very much for all your evidence, all of you. Um, it's been very valuable to have this round table. It's given us a wide variety of views. It's given us a particular focus as the Scottish Parliament, looking at the future of the Scottish industry in all our geographical diversity. And uh, we shall be uh, tackling the various other panels in due course. I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, evidence as witnesses. There are one or two people who were going to provide us with some more information who we've asked, and the, the clerks will remind you uh, at the end. As we agreed earlier, we'll move into private session. The next meeting will be on the 4th of February of the committee, and we will continue the inquiry on the dairy industry and hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, uh, uh, Food and Environment. And I would now ask you in the uh, public gallery, uh, if we can uh, clear this within five minutes, we need a short break as well. Uh, we'd love to stand and chat, and there's a lot of questions to ask, but thank you very much and goodbye just now.